Okay. Good morning, guys. Thanks for joining us. Um, so we're going to talk about cranial nerves in the eye today um, to start off with, and then we'll do a bit of embryology, have a break, and then go through sort of the bulk of head and neck anatomy. Um, with head and neck, it's kind of, it's a lot of material um, and it's a lot of just like rote learning stuff, unfortunately. But the main kinds of exam questions that you're going to get, especially pertaining to like cranial nerves, is going to be pathology stuff. So they'll give you like someone has this defect. What, what's the injury? What's the lesion? So you need to know the functions of the cranial nerves and to some extent, like the pathway of cranial nerves. So you know where the lesions occur. Um, but some of the more intricate details and like branches of branches, you probably don't need to know so much but a lot of it you cover in anatomy anyway. So we've put sort of maximal detail into the slides, but rest assured that not all of it is really that high yield, um, but it's more so there for your own learning and reading and enjoyment if you so happen to enjoy that. <laughs> so we're gonna get started with cranial nerves. Um, any questions, just pop them in the chat as usual and or unmute yourself if you feel like doing that. Um, so we'll start off with an overview of the cranial nerves. Hopefully you guys are like pretty familiar with most of this already, um, but I think it's nice to see everything sort of in one go and get an idea of what the main functions of each nerve are. So starting with cranial nerve one, your olfactory nerve, primarily it's just for smell, nice and easy. Cranial nerve two is the optic nerve, which does your vision. Cranial nerve three, four, uh, three, four, and six, they do your extraocular eye muscles. And you might've heard like the memory mnemonic SO4 LR6 um, for like chemistry nerds, I guess. But um, the fourth cranial nerve, the trochlear nerve does your superior oblique muscle, hence SO4. And the sixth cranial nerve, abducens, does lateral rectus, LR6. So those two are nice and easy. And then all the rest of the extra ocular eye muscles are innervated by cranial nerve three, ocular motor. And cranial nerve three also does a little bit of um, parasympathetic stuff with pupillary constriction. And then in between, you've got sort of a big boy cranial nerve five trigeminal, which is predominantly a, sens a sensory nerve. So it does like all of your facial sensation, but then it's got a couple other special features as well. One of them being taste for the anterior two thirds of the tongue and also a little bit of motor with the muscles of mastication. And they go with the third branch um, of trigeminal, which is the mandibular branch. Then we get to the facial nerve, which if you think of trigeminal as kind of the main facial sensory nerve, Facial nerve is kind of the main motor nerve of the face. So it does sort of all your muscles of facial expression. Um, and it does sort of a couple other things as well. Gland secretion, anterior two thirds of the tongue for taste, bit of ear, um, kind of a hodgepodge of everything. Eight is a little bit more straightforward. Eight is vestibulocochlear, which does hearing and balance, which kind of makes sense with the name, which is nice. Um, glossopharyngeal is kind of my least favorite of the cranial nerves because it's, I don't know, it doesn't really, it's not a, a nice category the way that the other cranial nerves are. So it does a bit of taste, bit of sensation, some random sensory stuff, a bit of secretion and a bit of motor as well. It's literally a bit of everything. Vagus you'll already be quite familiar with from GIT. So that does like the parasympathetics of um, all of the gastrointestinal system up to like the splenic flexure, but it does also have some roles in the head and neck, um, mainly like sensation and muscle of like the throat um, and neck kind of area. And then the last two are nice and easy again. Cranial nerve 11 is the accessory nerve, which does trapezius and sternocleidomastoid, those two muscles only. And the 12th cranial nerve hypoglossal as your tongue muscles, except for palatoglossus, which is kind of a pain, but all the other tongue muscles. So that's kind of the big overview, but we'll go in depth with each of the cranial nerves. So starting with the origin of them, this is something that comes up a lot in anatomy um, and rarely outside of anatomy, but the first two cranial nerves originate from the cerebrum. Um, the rest of them originate from the brainstem. And you'll often be asked like which portion 
of the brainstem the different cranial nerves originate from. So if this is sort of anterior looking at the brainstem, you've got the three sections, the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. And they kind of go sort of superior to inferior with the numbering, which is nice. So cranial nerve three comes out here between the pons and the midbrain. So the midbrain pontine junction here, and it just comes out anteriorly either side. Cranial nerve four is kind of weird. It's the only one that comes out posteriorly. So it actually comes out the posterior aspect of the midbrain and then wraps around. So that's this little nerve tucking in here. So it wraps around. Then you've got trigeminal, which just sticks straight out the side of the pons. So we've gone three, four, five. And then your six to eight or are all at the pontine medullary junction and they go sort of medial to lateral, six, seven, eight. Then nine, 10, 11 go uh, superior to inferior along the medulla here and 12 just kind of sticks out a little more anteriorly. From there, they then travel sort of across the base of the skull and eventually they have to exit the skull to go ahead and innovate everything outside of the brain. So you do also get asked about which specific cranial foramina the different cranial nerves come out of. And this is again, an exercise in rote learning, which is kind of a pain. But again, there's somewhat arranged anterior to posterior. So if you start in the anterior fossa, um, this here, you've got the cribriform plate, which is kind of a thin layer of bone with a whole bunch of holes in it. And the um, olfactory nerve kind of lies across the top and then sends like little protrusions down through those holes into the nasal cavity so you can smell. That's the cribriform plate there. The second cranial nerve, optic nerve, makes sense. It goes through the optic canal and that's in here, tucked away there. And that'll pass through into the orbit where the eyeball is. The superior orbital fissure sort of on the other side of the sphenoid also passes into the orbit and it carries quite a few nerves. So you can see it's pretty wide for that reason. It carries, I think of it as three through to six. So it's three, four and six with also a bit of five. So it carries the ophthalmic branch of five. Um, and you just think of all of this as going to the eye, right? So remember three, four and six innovate your extraocular eye muscles. So they should go to the eye. And V1 is the ophthalmic branch, so should also go to the eye. So it makes sense that these four branches go through the superior orbital fissure. The other two branches of the trigeminal go through other random little foramina. So V2, the maxillary branch, goes through the foramen rotundum. And the mandibular branch goes through the foramen ovale. And the way that I remember that is the mandibular branch is the one that has the motor component. So it's a chunkier nerve. Um, and therefore it needs the bigger frame and the oval there. Then we get to the posterior cranial fossa, um, which has sort of nerves seven through to 12. So the internal acoustic meatus is the next one back. Makes sense that the acoustic meatus would transmit the eighth cranial nerve, the vestibular cochlea for balance and hearing. And then because you can't really skip nerves, if it's gonna do eight, it has to also carry seven. So we've got seven and eight going through the internal acoustic meatus. And then you've got this bean-shaped one, the jugular foramen, which does sort of nine through to 11. And then lucky last, the hypoglossal nerve has its own little hypoglossal canal separate from the rest. So that's the cranial foramen, anterior to posterior, roughly. Okay, so once they get out of the cranial cavity, they start to do all sorts of things in terms of sensory and motor and parasympathetic and whatnot. I think like if you, if you do a lot of reading in on this, you'll find that they differentiate between like somatic sensory and visceral sensory or somatic motor and visceral motor. I don't think that's all that important to differentiate. The main things that you should know are um, what is sensory and what is special sensory? Special sensory being like sight, smell, taste, hearing, and balance. And then in terms of the motor, just knowing if it's like a movement kind of motor. So if it's moving skeletal muscles or visceral, um, or if it's autonomic. So if you have parasympathetics or sympathetics, and that's gonna be mainly to do with like glandular secretions. So like your par parotid gland and your lacrimal gland, um, and also like controlling the pupil, for example, to dilate and constrict. That's tied to your autonomic motor system because you guys already know that like fight or flight, your pupil will dilate. Okay, 
So let's start on the nerves. We'll start with cranial nerve one, which is nice and easy. Ease ourselves into it. Um, cranial nerve one, olfactory nerve, we've said already, is just responsible for smell. That's it. It's the shortest cranial nerve, so it's very easy to sort of visualize because it just comes from sort of the cerebrum. And then if you imagine this is your brain up here, right? So it's a cross section through the side here and you can see the nasal cavity brain would sit up here and it's got this direct extension through the cribriform plate into the nasal cavity like that. And so you get all these individual little olfactory nerves with little olfactory receptors on the end and they detect the smell, transmit it up through those nerves, which then collect into this optic bulb. Um, and that's how you really detect smell. I don't think it's all that important to know much more in terms of the intricacies of those nerves. This is also, I don't, I don't think that important, but it gets mentioned. So I've put the notes in here if anyone does want to read about the olfactory mucosa, but it's not very high yield. So, so the thing that is high yield is what happens when the cranial nerves get messed up. And so in the case of cranial nerve one, if you damage the nerve for any reason at all, then the result of that is that you're gonna lose your sense of smell. And that's called anosmia. So there's all sorts of things that can cause it. Um, the probably, probably the main ones to know would be like trauma. So they'll often ask, um, like if you have a fracture of the cribriform plate, what would you expect to see? You'd expect that they would damage their um, olfactory nerves and therefore have um, impaired sense of smell. The other ones to know are sort of uh, Coleman syndrome, because if you remember from repro, Coleman syndrome, one of the hallmarks of it is anosmia, because there's some issue with like um, the nerves descending through the cribriform plate. And then there's other things as well. So infections that cause sort of inflammation of the nerve, COVID-19 being one of them, um, and also degenerative conditions. The optic nerve. So the optic nerve is much more important than the, the olfactory nerve, and it's very high yield. Arguably one of the highest yield of the cranial nerves. Um, it's responsible for vision. So again, it's special sensory only. And the important thing to know with the optic nerve is the entire pathway, basically. Um, and what all the different visual defects would be depending on where you get lesions. So the extracranial course of the optic nerve, basically sort of starting from the eyeball, um, is sort of with the retina. So we know that light comes through the eyeball and hits the retina. And it's important to note that it's sort of the, the light kind of crosses over. So the temporal field of vision, this side here, is detected by the nasal portion of the retina. And the nasal field of vision is detected by the temporal portion of the retina. So you get that kind of crossing over. Basically, everything is backwards with the optic nerve. So once we've got that detection along the retina by the photoreceptors, the, they converge to form the optic nerve here at the optic disc. And then we get all of this stuff here. So you, you can pretty easily see how damage at the optic nerve here would cause monocular blindness, i.e. it would knock out this entire eyeball, but you would have perfectly intact vision on this side because it's unrelated. So that's this image here. You get a lesion in the right optic nerve, you get monocular blindness. After that is probably the most high yield want to know because for some reason, Monash are obsessed with this one. Um, when they get to sort of once they've come into the cranial cavity, um, the, the nasal portions actually cross over at the optic chiasm. So this is the optic chiasm here and it's in close proximity to the um, pituitary gland. And here you can see portions of each nerve cross over. And so then you end up with um, an optic tract that is just the left field of view and an optic tract that is just the right field of view in both eyes. Importantly, if you get a lesion at the optic chiasm, you can see that you lose this portion of each eye. So you lose the temporal field of view of one eye and the temporal field of view of the other eye. And so that's this picture here. The nasal field of view is normal, but they're blind on the outer halves of each eyeball. And that's called bilateral temporal hemianopia. 
temporal indicating which hemianopia it is and hemianopia meaning like half blindness right so half the visual field is knocked out and the most important cause to know of this is a pituitary adenoma so pituitary adenoma causes a bilateral uh, temporal hemianopia because of compression at the optic chiasm Okay, and then after this, it sort of gets progressively lower and lower yield. <laughs> so the optic tract comes next. Um, and you can see that this optic tract transmits the left field of vision, so the red part of each. So the right optic tract transmits the left field of vision. The left optic tract transmits the right field of vision. It's all opposites. So if you get a lesion, then it becomes a homonymous hemianopia as opposed to a biotemporal. And the reason it's homonymous is because you lose the same side visual field in each. So you can see in three here, you've lost the left field of vision in both eyes as opposed to the bitemporal hemianopia where you lose the temporal field of view in both eyes. So this is homonymous hemianopia and it's when you've knocked out the optic tract after that crossover has happened. Um, it's the same here that, so five is just pointing to the lateral geniculate nucleus, which is the same as the lesion at three. From there, it doesn't stop splitting. So from there, the optic tract splits in two, into two radiations, an upper radiation and a lower radiation. And the lower radiation does this kind of loop. And that's called the Myers loop. So again, everything is backwards. So the upper radiation transmits the inferior field of view and the inferior radiation or the lower radiation transmits the upper field of view. So picture, so say for example, we have a lesion in the right upper optic radiation, you would expect a defect in the left lower visual field, which is what you've got here. So that's a quadrantinopia because you've only lost a quarter of the vision. If you have a lesion in the left lower optic radiation, then you'd expect a right upper quadrantinopia. So it's always the opposite, okay? Those optic radiations then converge at the visual cortex at the back here. And so because you've got them converging, it becomes like a lesion there would become a hemianopia again. Um, but specifically at the visual cortex, especially if it's knocked out by a stroke, for example, you get macula sparing, which is why you've got this little open circle in there. Um, and the reason that you get macula sparing is because this area of the brain is largely supplied uh, by one artery, but the occipital pole in particular, which innovates the macula, has dual blood supply by the MCA and the PCA. So you imagine a stroke that knocks out the rest of the visual cortex, um, you'd have preservation of the occipital pole. And so you'd preserve the macula there and you get macula sparing. That's all the visual defects. Here's a bunch of other pictures to help you kind of visualize things. Um, you kind of have to just draw it out a bunch of times yourself, I think. That's probably the best way to learn it. Okay, and then we get to the ocular motor nerve. So now we're getting to the extraocular eye muscles. Um, the ocular motor nerve is really mainly a motor nerve, but there are some sort of parasympathetic components and there's a little bit of a sympathetic component as well, but it's mainly motor. Um, and it sort of emerges from the anterior surface of the midbrain, as we said, kind of, and then it comes up, pierces the dura mater, and it enters the cavernous sinus. Now the cavernous sinus is very important to know about, comes up a lot. And it took me a long time to understand where it actually is. It's basically this like pathway along the base of the skull through which a whole bunch of cranial nerves go through in order to reach the superior orbital fissure, right? And so you'll learn about pathologies here of the cavernous sinus and how they impact cranial nerves. So this is kind of the picture you should have in your mind. The cranial nerves are emerging from the brainstem here and then passing through the cavernous sinus in order to reach the superior orbital fissure where they emerge from the skull. Okay, 
So the ocular motor nerve passes through this pathway, gets to the superior orbital fissure and goes into the orbit, like we said. From there, it divides into a superior branch and an inferior branch. The superior branch comes up over the top here. So it kind of just innervates everything at the top, which is your levator palpebrae superioris and your sort of superior rectus. Um, it also does the little sympathetic fibers to the superior tarsal muscle. Uh, oh, the inferior branch comes down and just does all the rest of the muscles of the, um, of the eye here. Um, but it also importantly transmits the parasympathetic fibers. So this here is the superior branch going up and this here is the inferior branch coming down. And there's a couple parasympathetic fibers that follow along with this and pass to the ciliary ganglion where they then go on to constrict the pupil and also alter the lens. But we'll sort of run through the parasympathetics at the end. The parasympathetics are a real headache um, with this topic because they emerge from one particular nerve and then they might travel with a different nerve. So I think it's easiest to learn parasympathetics in one go at the end. Cranial nerve palsy. Um, so for the ocular motor nerve, you probably already know um, some of the key features that you'll see are a down and out vision. So you imagine that it, all of the extraocular muscles have been knocked out except the lateral rectus and the superior oblique. And the function of those muscles is to abduct and depress the eye. So the eye is sort of sitting, pointing down and out at rest. That's very characteristic of a third nerve palsy. Um, and then the other features are ptosis. So you get drooping of the eyelid. And that's because remember, oculomotor also innervates the levator palpebra superioris that elevates the eyelid. Um, and you get medriasis, which is a dilated pupil. And that's because um, the parasympathetic fibers of oculomotor innervated the um, pupillary sphincter. Trochlear nerve is like, it's a nice, easy, small nerve. Um, so this kind of is a little bit of a break before you hit the trigeminal. <laughs> so trochlea just does the superior oblique muscle, which the oblique um, eye muscles are sort of the most difficult because they do a lot of things. So the superior oblique muscle is responsible for intorsion, which is rotating the eyeball inwards, abduction and depression. So it's the down and out, but also it does the intorsion. Um, you don't need to know too much about the course of the trochlear nerve, to be honest. But a trochlear nerve palsy, um, classically what you see isn't actually sort of um, the eye pointing weirdly at rest. And that's because the abduction action of superior oblique and the depression action of superior oblique can be compensated for by your other eye muscles. It's actually the rotation that can't be compensated for. That's only done by the oblique muscle. And so what happens is you get the, the eyeball twisting outwards because you've got unopposed extorsion. And so the head, the person actually tilts their head away in order to compensate for that vision. So you can see here that this eyeball is kind of rotated outwards. So to compensate, the person tilts their head to fix this eyeball. And then the um, unaffected eye can rotate inwards to compensate. So if someone walks in, or if there's an exam question, um, with sort of like a head tilt and like diplopia, it's a trochlear nerve palsy. Uh, before we do trigeminal nerve, we'll just quickly touch on abducens to finish off the extraocular eye muscles. So abducens does the last of the extraocular eye muscles, the lateral rectus, that's the LR6. Um, and lateral rectus is nice and easy. It just is responsible for abduction of the eye pulling it laterally. Again, the course of this nerve is not that important. So if you've got um, absence of abduction from lateral rectus, then the affected eye is going to be turned inwards because you have unopposed adduction. Um, and that causes diplopia because you've got one eye pointing normally and one eye that's turned inwards slightly. So these people will complain of diplopia and you'll see one eye is turned slightly inwards or they'll be slightly cross-eyed. That's an abducens nerve palsy. Cool. Now let's talk about trigeminal because trigeminal is a big one. 
trigeminal though like if you mainly think of it as a sensory nerve of the face that's probably like 90 percent of what you need to know to be honest and then you just have to memorize one picture so you know they talk about i think in a lecture they talked about all the origins of the trigeminal nerve really not that important to know um but there's various sensory nuclei <clears throat> and then a motor nucleus and they all converge to form like the trigeminal ganglion which gives off your first, second, and third branches. The motor component actually joins later and it just joins onto the third branch. So that's where the three branches come from. We already know where the three branches pass through. So ophthalmic goes through the superior orbital fissure, maxillary through the foramen rotundum, and mandibula through the foramen ovale. And then we just need to know what each of those branches innervates. So the ophthalmic branch, ophthalmic meaning eye, passes through the superior orbital fissure along with all your other eyeball related uh, nerves, gets to the orbit and it branches into a couple different bits and pieces, mainly sensory. So you've got a frontal nerve, which kind of produces two branches that go up to do the scalp and the forehead. You've got a lacrimal nerve, which is gonna do your lacrimal gland. And then you have the nasociliary nerve, which kind of does a little bit of like the nasal bridge and um, the eyelid. The picture that you need to remember is this one in the corner here. Um, that will answer most exam questions about trigeminal nerve. Just knowing the distributions of each branch and what they innovate. So V1 you can see is doing like the upper eyelid area, the nasal bridge, and then scalp and forehead. There are some sympathetic fibers. The color coding, by the way, green represents sensory, pink is uh, sympathetic. That's just to help you for when you're going through the notes uh, by yourself. Um, there is a sympathetic component to it. And the sympathetic component is to dilate the pupil. But it's not, it's not sympathetic fibers that originate from the trigeminal nerve. It's all like hitchhiking. Okay, so these are all the branches in detail if you wish to learn them, but really as long as you know the sensory distribution of the nerve, you should be pretty okay. The maxillary branch is the second one, and the maxillary branch kind of does this like cheek area down to like the upper lip and upper teeth. So the first two are sort of separated by your eyeball and like the nose. And then nerves two and three, branches two and three are sort of separated by your mouth and teeth. Um, there are many branches of the maxillary nerve, as you can see here. And I think at one point in anatomy, some people learned them, but there's really no need to. I don't think I've ever seen an exam question on the individual branches of the maxillary nerve. It's more of an anatomy flex. Um, the main thing to know is the functions of them. So if you know what this innervates, you're pretty set. Again, it carries some parasympathetic fibers, but the fibers don't originate from this nerve. You can kind of think of it as the trigeminal nerve because it's innervating all of the face. It's sort of got all of these branches in place that cover different aspects of the face. So if you need parasympathetic fibers to travel to various parts of the face, it makes sense to hitchhike with the trigeminal nerve, which already has branches going everywhere. And that's sort of what happens with the parasympathetics. But these fibers actually originate from the seventh nerve, the facial nerve, um, and then they go to various areas. The last branch is the mandibular branch, which is probably the most important branch to know for the trigeminal nerve. And that's because it has the motor component. So you've got various sensory components to it. The first branch is the auriculotemporal, which kind of just goes back to do a bit of ear. Then you've got the buckle, which does a bit of cheek. And then you've got the lingual as well, which comes down and does um, sensation to the tongue. The one that you need to know most importantly is the inferior alveolar branch, which comes down. And that does some sensation, but more importantly, it does the muscles. So it has a motor nerve to mylohyoid and anterior digastric. And then it comes through and it supplies the teeth. And finally, once it's done the teeth, it pokes out through the mental foramen and becomes the mental nerve. So it has lots of different components to it. And the mental nerve sort of supplies sensation to this lower chin and lip area. The picture again for reference, 
So you've got auricular temporal, which as the name suggests, there's a bit of ear and a bit of temple. You've got like a, and then you've got these branches down here with your sensation along the jawline and your inferior teeth. And you'll have the mental nerve coming out and doing the chin there. In terms of the muscles, so V3 is the only branch of trigeminal that conducts motor axons. Um, and it supplies the muscles of mastication, which is four. So there's the masseter, the medial and lateral pterygoid, and the temporalis, and then a couple other miscellaneous um, muscles. The tensor tympani is actually quite important um, because it has a role in dampening sound. If there's damage to that uh, muscle there, if that muscle can't function properly, um, you can actually cause significant damage to like the internal ear. The main trigeminal nerve pathologies that you have to know, apart from like palsy, which would be, which would just cause sensory defects across the three distributions, is trigeminal neuralgia and herpes zoster or shingles. So trigeminal neuralgia is just like a chronic neuropathic pain. And it's where like um, non-painful stimuli, so like touching someone's face triggers severe pain. Um, and it's ca caused by uh, nerve damage and it's treated actually with like an anti-epileptic carbamazepine. Um, but basically it's hypersensitivity to pain. The other one is shingles. So you might've heard of shingles already. Shingles has a very characteristic pattern. So it's caused by the herpes zoster virus, which also causes chicken pox. And then after chicken pox, it lies dormant in nerve ganglion. And then um, it can become sort of reactivated. And when it reactivates, it causes these painful blistering vesicles, specifically in the pattern of one particular dermatome. And it doesn't cross the midline. You can see there's a pretty clear demarcation here. It doesn't cross the midline and it stays within one dermatome. So you can get shingles in the abdomen, in the torso, and you'll get just like a band of um, these vesicles in one particular dermatome. In the face, in terms of the trigeminal nerve, you'll get um, the vesicles in one particular distribution. And V1 is the most common. So it'd be something like this. Doesn't cross the midline, doesn't cross into the other dermatomes. There's a mention of trigeminal nerve blocks in anatomy for like anesthetics if you want to block particular areas. Um, it's, it occasionally comes up in exam questions, but it's not the most high yield. Um, if you kind of think about where each nerve runs, that'll give you a good enough idea of what um, blocking that nerve will do. So your infraorbital, for example, it comes down and it will sort of reach the upper lip and upper teeth. And so if you want to um, block pain sensation to those areas, you'd block the infraorbital nerve. And um, this is actually mainly in sort of a dental context. So that's why there's a lot of talk of like teeth and cheeks and stuff like that. The mental nerve, we already said, innervates the lower lip and chin. The buccal nerve would be sort of the cheek area. And then your inferior alveolar, which comes down like this, would be for your lower teeth and also the tongue. And there, there is actually questions often about like why um, blocking the inferior alveolar nerve will block sensation to the tongue even though it's the lingual nerve that innervates the tongue. And it's because these two nerves lie in very close proximity. So if you inject anesthetic to the inferior alveolar, you're probably gonna knock out the lingual nerve as well. Okay, so then we get to the facial nerve. So if trigeminal nerve is mainly the sensory nerve, facial nerve is mainly the motor nerve. And so it does all the muscles of facial expression along with a couple other sort of neck muscles and then a, a light smattering of everything else. So a bit of sensation around the ear, special sensory taste to the anterior two thirds of the tongue and parasympathetics. And facial nerve is probably the main nerve that has like parasympathetic activity in the head and neck. Um, and these, these fibers actually originate from the facial nerve, they're not just hitchhiking. So the, the course of the facial nerve is kind of convoluted and that's only because it runs through the facial canal within the skull which has kind of like a z-shaped course that's the really that's really the only reason so this is all intracranial um, it emerges from a big motor root and then a small tiny sensory root and it gives us three branches within the skull greater petrosal nerve to stapedius which is just literally a small motor nerve to one muscle 
and the quarter tympani, which is quite important. Then it exits through the stylomastoid foramen, which is kind of like behind the ear here. And it comes out and it does all those terminal motor branches. Everything extracranial for the facial nerve is motor only. Um, all the parasympathetic special sensory stuff is all intracranial. So the intracranial course, these pictures are just kind of to help you try to visualize it. It's a very kind of weird pathway, um, but you can have a look at those. And then once it comes out, once it emerges from the stylomastoid foramen, it's purely motor in function. So it gives off three branches kind of posteriorly and inferiorly. Um, posterior auricular, which goes backwards and upwards, and then little tiny nerves to digastric and stylohyoid to specifically innervate those muscles. And then it's got five main terminal branches, temporal zygomatic, the temporal going up, zygomatic coming sort of across the cheek, buccal coming sort of a little bit further down the cheek, marginal mandibular along the margin of the mandible, and cervical going down to the neck. So it kind of co covers like that. Um, they're the five terminal branches. And here you can see the list of like everything that it innovates. I don't think it's too important to know like specifically what is innovated by which branch, um, but just having an idea of all of the different types of muscles of facial expression. Okay. The other functions of the facial nerve. So aside from doing like all of the muscles of facial expression, which is mainly from those five terminal branches that come out after it's emerged from the cranial cavity, it has a couple other functions um, and these emerge intracranially. So the corda tympani, the corda tympani is actually the branch that supplies the taste to the anterior two thirds of the tongue. And it has parasympathetic fibers that go to the salivary glands. So the quarter tympani you can kind of think of as going down to the mouth and it's going to do the special sensory there and it's going to do the parasympathetic Sorry, there. I'm having trouble hearing you. I've activated my Siri. <laughs> um, and then you also have the greater petrosal nerve, which is parasympathetic as well. And really the end function of that nerve is to innervate the lacrimal glands um, of the eye. So that's producing your tear film and the mucous glands of the mouth, nose and pharynx. So you can see that the parasympathetics are very much like a glandular secretion kind of function. Very complex convoluted pathway. I don't think it's all that important to know as long as you know the originating nerve, where it ends up and what it ends up acting on. Um, and sometimes you get asked about the ganglion and that would be the pterygopalatine ganglion. Facial nerve palsy. Uh, pretty self-explanatory, pretty intuitive. You're probably going to get paralysis of the facial muscles. Um, but the thing that's kind of high yield and that they love asking about here is um, forehead sparing and how that differentiates between like an actual facial nerve lesion, like Bell's palsy, or a stroke, which is like a supranuclear intracranial kind of lesion up here. So the main thing to know with this is that the forehead receives bilateral supply. So the left side of the forehead is innervated by an area of the left side of the cortex and the right side of the cortex, and same with the right side. But the lower half of the face only receives unilateral supply, and that's the green line here. So if you have a lesion that knocks out the facial nerve here, um, you get paralysis of sort of the entire half of the face because this is sort of lower down, right? But if you have a supranuclear lesion, so like a stroke in the cortex affecting like the facial nuclei, you actually get forehead sparing. And that's because the, the left side of the, or the right side of the forehead here, sorry, is gonna receive some dual supply from the other side of the cortex. And so you get forehead sparing in a supranuclear lesion, but full sort of paralysis in a lower lesion. The vestibulocochlear nerve is nice and easy. Um, vestibulo literally will like means balance and cochlea is a component of the ear, so hearing. So it is hearing and balance. 
they actually, it's actually sort of the combination of two separate nerves, the vestibular component and cochlear component. They originate separately, they merge to travel together, and then they also end up separate. So the vestibular part of it will go to the vestibular ganglion to do balance, and the cochlear part of it goes to your ear, like the inner ear, to do hearing. That's pretty self-explanatory, I think. You don't have to know too much else about the course of the vestibular cochlear nerve. Um, pathologies of the vestibular cochlear nerve, like vestibular neuritis occasionally comes up, but is not that um, high yield. But it kind of, it's pretty intuitive in that if you have inflammation of that particular nerve, the vestibular branch, which being responsible for balance, you expect symptoms that correspond to like balance issues. So vertigo, nystagmus, and nausea and vomiting. If you have damage to the cochlear component or to both components, you end up with a hearing loss. And specifically, that's a sensory neural hearing loss as opposed to a conduction hearing loss. And we'll talk about the specific difference between those in the clinical skills component. Um, the main cause of this that you have to know, though, is a skull at the um, is a fracture at the base of the skull, sorry. And some of the other signs of that that you get are include like um, CSF leaking through the ear and through the nose, and also bleeding of, uh, around the ears and nose. So the functions, so next we have the gloss glossopharyngeal nerve, which is kind of another big messy one. Um, and it's sort of like a smattering of all sorts of random stuff. So there's sensory functions, there's special sensory functions in terms of taste, there's parasympathetic function for the parotid gland, um, and it does one little muscle as well, the stylopharyngeus. But I think of glossopharyngeal as mainly a sensory nerve, um, random bits of sensation and taste. So this picture is pretty good if you want to know like the full course of the glossopharyngeal nerve, because I think it draws it all out quite clearly. Um, but it kind of comes out and then it gives off the tympanic branch. And that's going to go to do like sensation to the ear. And then it comes down and does everything else. And it travels sort of down the neck with the internal carotid artery. And then it gives off its little branch to stylopharyngeus, that little muscle. Um, then it gives off sort of sensory branches to the pharynx, to the tonsils. Um, there's a lingual component as well. And then the pharyngeal branch is actually what transmits that taste part of it. And that's taste from the posterior third of the tongue. Whereas remember, facial did the anterior two thirds of the tongue. Um, it ends with this sort of carotid body slash sinus branch. Okay, in terms of the parasympathetic component of the glossopharyngeal nerve, that travels with the tympanic branch here, goes through the otic ganglion uh, to the parotid glands. Vagus nerve. So vagus nerve, everything sort of neck downwards you guys probably already uh, know about. But in terms of like what's in the head, it actually starts off with a sensory branch to the ear, which is very random. Um, but it does that sort of intracranially and then it exits through the jugular foramen, travels down the neck and throughout the neck, it's giving off like motor nerves. So you've got a pharyngeal nerve. So it's actually responsible for a lot of the muscles of the pharynx and the soft palate um, and the superior laryngeal branch, which has an internal and external. Weirdly, this is high yield. So like there's quite a few exam questions floating around differentiating between like internal superior laryngeal and external superior laryngeal. So knowing the difference between what those innovate and what muscles they innovate is pretty important. After that bit of it, after the neck, you guys already know that it gives off recurrent laryngeal nerves in different locations on the left and the right. Into the thorax, you get um, a, sort of the esophageal and cardiac plexuses that it kind of just mixes within. And then you get into the abdomen after the esophageal hiatus of the diaphragm, and it does parasympathetic innovation all the way down the GI tract to the splenic flexure. So this is kind of like to summarize each component of the vagus nerve, because it's a lot. So the sensory function of the vagus nerve, you've got a random bit of like skin around the ear for some reason, and then it's everything else is sort of like G GIT related. So sort of vocal cords, heart, GIT, and then you've got the random taste component as well. 
Um, vagus nerve actually does taste to like the very, very back of the mouth, the root of the tongue and the epiglottis. So taste is actually the combined um, innovations of seven, nine, and 10, depending on which portion of the tongue and mouth you're talking about. The motor component is all of this, bunch of pharynx, bunch of larynx, cricothyroid, specifically by the external laryngeal branch, for some reason that's important, and then the palatoglossus and soft palate muscles. Parasympathetic function, none of it is head and neck, um, but it has actions in the heart in terms of keeping your heart rate at a normal level. So um, maintaining a constant vagal tone on the SA and AV nodes, and then throughout the gastrointestinal tract. Lesions of the vagus nerve, um, you get a couple sort of key motor functions. This is ignoring everything below the head and neck. Like obviously if you have a vagus nerve lesion up here, you're going to have like GIT consequences, cardiac consequences. But in terms of what you can see in head and neck and what you would examine for in a cranial nerve exam, um, you get deviation of the uvula specifically away from the side of the lesion. Um, you get loss of the gag reflex and you get issues with swallowing. So you just imagine that all of the muscles sort of in the back of the throat are paralyzed. They're unable to function. So you won't be able to swallow very well. And even though um, they would be able to feel stimuli at the back of the throat, the muscles can't contract to gag. So there's loss of the gag reflex as well. Um, if there is involvement of the recurrent laryngeal nerve a little further down, that's when you get the hoarse voice. So you might've talked about like with thyroid surgeries and things like that you get a hoarse voice because of compression of the recurrent laryngeal nerve or like an aortic aneurysm you get a hoarse voice because of compression of the recurrent laryngeal nerve um it's pretty like buzzwordy in in preclin um and so the important thing to know though is that you get a hoarse voice only for the unilateral injury and that's because you get paralysis of one vocal fold if both are damaged um, that's actually like an emergency because both vocal cords like relax um, and that actually closes off the airway and they get strider, which is where you have like um, a sound on inspiration because of an airway obstruction. And then we can finish off with two easy nerves. So the 11th cranial nerve is the spinal accessory nerve. It has two jobs and two jobs only to innervate the sternocleidomastoid and the trapezius muscles. Um, it's actually a combination of like some cervical, cervical nerve roots as well. So you've got like C1 to like five or six, which kind of come up. The fibers enter the cranial cavity through the foramen magnum and then come back out through the jugular foramen and descend down the neck to innervate sternocleidomastoid, which kind of runs in this direction and is responsible for turning your head and the trapezius muscles at the back, which help you shrug your shoulders. And so they're the tests of the 11th cranial nerve that you do on an exam. Um, if it's sort of long-term, you'd also see muscle wasting, but that's not always necessarily the case. And the thing that they love to mention with it is that um, it's frequently damaged in the posterior triangle of the neck because it runs very superficially. And then lucky last is the hypoglossal nerve. So the hypoglossal nerve innervates your muscles of the tongue. So you can see it comes down here. Remember it exits from its own little canal, the hypoglossal canal, comes down, loops around to the tongue and then innervates like everything in there with the exception of palatoglossus, which is innervated by the vagus nerve. Um, there's differentiation between sort of the extrinsic and intrinsic muscles of the tongue. I'm not sure how important it is to know the difference between all of these ones. Um, but the main thing to know is that if you have a paralysis of the tongue muscles due to a hypoglossal nerve lesion, the tongue deviates towards the side of the lesion. So a left-sided lesion, the tongue will point towards the left when they stick out their tongue, as opposed to the vagus nerve lesions where the uvula points in the opposite direction of the lesion. So there's a key difference between those two. This is just thrown in for completion's sake. It's more of a neck thing. But the answer cervicalis, once you go past the hypoglossal nerve, you've also got some C1 and C2 roots that contribute to innervating like muscles of the neck. Um, and some of those fibers do travel with the hypoglossal nerve, as you can see here. 
So you've got the geniohyoid, which elevates the hyoid bone, the thyrohyoid, which depresses the hyoid bone. And it forms this kind of little loop that's called the anterior cervicalis. And you get branches to various other neck muscles that all depress the hyoid bone. So this is what I think you need to know for parasympathetics of the head and neck. This is your final summary of parasympathetics. Um, there's this memory mnemonic COPS 3977, which is useful to the extent of telling you which cranial nerve goes to which ganglion, but not much beyond that. So the third cranial nerve goes to the ciliary ganglion. That's the three and the C. The ninth cranial nerve gives some fibers to the otic ganglion. That's the nine and the O. And then the seventh cranial nerve has two. So it can go to the pterygopalatine ganglion, that's the seven and the P, or the submandibular ganglion, the seven and the S. So that's the COPS 3977. From there, you kind of can work out from the name of the ganglion-ish what the target is going to be. Um, but this is really the highest yield bit to know, is like for each of these parasympathetic fibers, what do they innovate? Because again, the questions in exams aren't like, where exactly does this nerve go? The questions in the exam are someone has dry eyes and can't produce tears or something. What's the lesion? So um, the pupillary sphincter, we said was part of the ocular motor nerve. I think that one's fairly easy to remember because the eyeball should be linked with your eye nerve. Um, beyond that, it's a little bit trickier. But the submandibular ganglion and the submandibular salivary glands kind of make sense. And then the otic ganglion, otic meaning like around the earish, the protogland kind of sits close to the ear. So it kind of makes sense that they, that that innovates that. And then the pterygopalatine, I'm like, just whatever. It's everything else. The mucous membranes of the nose and the pharynx, the lacrimal gland. Um, I've put in the, like where the preganglionic fibers run and where the postganglionic fibers run. Probably not the most important to know, but it's there for completion if you do want to learn it. Okay, now we go on to the eye. How are we going for time? Roughly an hour. Okay, so starting with where the eyeball actually sits, we've got the bony orbit. And the bony orbit is like an amalgamation of many different bones, as you can see here. Um, I, you, it's not important to learn specifically which bones are where, I think, but having an idea that the zygomatic bone is kind of the outer rim um, and that the frontal bone is kind of the upper rim and then the maxilla kind of forms this lower medial portion can be helpful. Um, it's sort of described, the orbit is sort of described as like a roughly pyramidal shape. So I guess you can kind of picture this like a pyramid with the opening at the, you know, the eyeball, and then it sort of converges back to a very small um, optic canal where the optic nerve has come through. What does the orbit contain? A whole bunch of stuff, kind of self-explanatory. The eyeball, the eyelids, the muscles, the nerves that innervate those muscles, the blood vessels that supply those muscles, and so on. So the pathways into the orbit, if this is you looking sort of into an eyeball with removal of the eyeball, um, we already know the optic canal opens into the orbit because that's where the optic nerve came through. And it's also where the ophthalmic artery passes through. The superior orbital fissure we also know opens into the orbit because that's where three, four, V1 and six came through. And then there's also an inferior orbital fissure, which is kind of unimportant, but it's tucked away in the back here and it transmits a little branch of the maxillary nerve tiny vein and a couple nerves as well for the sympathetics. Um, but that's the key ones to know are really the optic canal and the superior orbital fissure. And this is really just for the purpose of like helping you visualize where everything goes. Um, in terms of fractures and like pathologies of the bony orbit itself, um, you can rarely get like actual fractures of the orbital rim. And the reason I say it's not so common is because the zygomatic bone, the maxilla, the frontal bone, they're all quite like thick and dense um, and not really that easily fractured and broken. If you do get a fracture, it would be along the sutures between multiple um, bones. So along these lines here where they kind of join. Um, the one that's probably a little higher yield and more important to know about is the blowout fracture. 
And that's when you get like a blunt force trauma to the eye. Um, I think the, the common example you get is like a tennis ball to the eye or something like that, or a baseball to the eye. And what happens is that when you get that force to the eyeball, it like transiently increases the pressure within the socket and it like blasts a hole, forces the, eye, the orbit contents through one of the bones. And it's most commonly the inferior aspect of the orbit. And so you get um, the orbital contents spilling into the maxillary sinus, which sits beneath it down here. Um, and that's because you can see here that this part of the bone is quite thin in comparison to like, you know, the lateral border. So if you've got a force pushing on these contents, it's much more likely to blast into the inferior cavity here. Rarely, like less commonly, it can also go into the ethmoid sinus, but given how much space there is in the maxillary sinus, it's most often um, downwards. Um, that causes a bunch of pain. It causes um, protrusion of the eye. You can get bleeding, all sorts of stuff. But this is mainly going to be like an x-ray finding. The extraocular eye muscles, we've already talked extensively about in terms of innovation. Um, but hopefully you guys know that there are four recti muscles named because they are like they run straight in their course. And that's what rectus means. So there's a medial and lateral, a superior and inferior. They're nice and easy. Uh, the oblique muscles are kind of weird. So there's an inferior oblique and a superior oblique. Now you can see here, I've kind of put the individual functions of each of them. Um, superior and inferior rectus do elevation and depression and a bit of adduction. And then the obliques do the opposite and a bit of abduction. There's also the LPS, giving up on calling it its full name, um, and that elevates the upper eyelid. And it also has a couple little sympathetic fibers called the superior tarsal muscle, but not that important. Um, so they're your seven extraocular eye muscles. And as we've discussed, they're all innervated by ocular motor nerve, except uh, the superior oblique by trochlea and the lateral rectus by abducens. And that's LR6 and SO4. Now, in terms of the eye movements, this, is, this has been pretty painful to learn, I feel like, um, at least it was for me. Um, so the way that I kind of think about it is in terms of like easiest to hardest. So the easiest ones to learn are the lateral and medial rectus. They're very straightforward because they just do what the name suggests. They abduct and they adduct. That's it. Nothing more to it. The, the recti and the oblique are a little confusing because they do two things. They, they can abduct or adduct and they can elevate or depress. So the first thing to know is that as you can see here, the rectus muscles, they adduct, and the oblique muscles, they abduct. The thing that's confusing though, is when you get someone to do eye movements, you get them to abduct first, like you get them to move the eye outwards first, and then from there you go up and down, right? From an abducted position, if we're thinking about this eye here, from an abducted position, in order to look up and down, it actually uses the rectus muscles despite the fact that the rectus muscles do adduction. And from an adducted position, in order to look up and down, it actually uses the oblique muscles. The reason for that is when you're in this abducted position, the oblique muscles are slack, right? They've kind of relaxed because you've already pulled it in this direction. And so they're not gonna do a very good job of elevating or depressing the eye because they're slack. It's actually going to be the muscles that are stretched, the rectus muscles, that will be able to elevate and depress. The other thing that's kind of confusing is that the obliques do the opposite to their name. So the inferior oblique elevates the eye and the superior oblique depresses the eye. Something to do with angles and vectors. I don't know. Um, so have a read of this note and try to like wrap your head around it. This idea that like the the muscles that abduct will be slack in the abducted position. And so you can't use them to then elevate and depress. You have to use the other muscles to elevate and depress. And then there's a note about rotation as well. So we've mentioned that the superior oblique in your trochlear nerve palsy does that in torsion or medial rotation. And the inferior oblique 
does the opposite, lateral rotation or X torsion. So this is that summary of sort of the nerve palsies and what the key features are. So um, paralysis of lateral rectus, you'll have an adducted eye at rest. Trochlear nerve, you get this sort of um, head tilt in order to compensate for the um, lack of intorsion. And ocular motor is the easiest to spot because it's a very characteristic down and out. Um, Horner's syndrome, you guys will also be familiar with, but I've just thrown it in here as well because it kind of relates to the eye. Um, any damage to the sympathetic trunk and the sympathetics of the head and neck will cause this sort of triad of bit of ptosis because of denervation of the superior tarsal muscle, um, meiosis, pupillary constriction due to loss of the dilator pupillar muscle, and anhydrosis, loss of sweating. The cause that you need to know about for this is Pankos tumor, which is a um, lung cancer, specifically at the apex of the lung. Okay. Then we have um, the eyeball itself. So for the eyeball itself, here are many diagrams of the different layers of the eyeball. If we start from outside to inside, um, you've got the sclera, which wraps all the way around and it's this thick protective coating. That's the white of the eye. Then you have the cornea, which is a con continuation of the sclera, but it has to be clear, obviously, because you need to see out the front of your eyeball. So it's a clear continuation of the sclera and its function is also just like protection. So sclera, cornea, and they provide shape and support. Then you have the vascular layer, which is outlined here. And so that sits just under that protective sclera. And it is basic, its function is basically to like provide nutritional support, blood supply, oxygen, um, all of that to the eyes. Um, so it's composed of the choroid, which is wrapping all the way around here. Then you have the ciliary bodies which is marked in yellow. And also the iris is kind of considered part of this layer as well. Um, the very, very inner layer is really where um, your vision happens. So this sits just inside of the choroid. There's actually a pigmented layer that kind of sits in between. And that pigmented layer wraps all the way around to kind of absorb excess light and prevent light like bouncing around inside the eyeball. Um, and then the actual, and then you have the actual photoreceptors sort of sitting on top of that basal layer. The important parts to know about this layer are the optic disc, where the nerves all converge together to form the optic nerve, and that forms your blind spot. So you can see there's like a bit of a gap here that they've marked where there's no actual photoreceptors covering there. So you have a little bit of a blind spot. And also the fovea, which sits just to the side of the optic disc. And this is where you have sort of a particularly high concentration of photoreceptors. And that's what gives you high acuity vision. So all the notes for that are there if you want to have a read. Other sort of miscellaneous structures of the eye um, between the iris, so either side of the iris, you've got the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber, both of which sit sort of in front of the lens. And these spaces are filled with aqueous humor uh, normally, which is kind of like a jelly sort of filling. And then behind the lens, you have another humor, but it's called the vitreous humor all the way through this space here. So that's the posterior and anterior chambers, the aqueous and the vitreous humor. And then of course you have the lens and the lens is attached to these ciliary bodies that help to contract um, and relax in order to change the shape of the lens to accommodate near and distant vision. Vasculature of the eye, um, ophthalmic artery and ophthalmic vein. Um, you don't have to know much beyond that, to be honest. But the thing that might sometimes come up is that there is a specific branch of the ophthalmic artery, the central retinal artery, which is actually responsible for supplying the internal surface of the retina. So any sort of occlusion of this artery will cause blindness in that eye. Now the eyelids, again, something that's like taught in quite a bit of depth in anatomy for some reason. Um, the eyelids, their function is pretty self-explanatory to protect from light, protect from injury, protect from dust. 
Um, and also they have this function when you blink of moving tears um, for lubrication across the eye because the lacrimal gland kind of feeds into the lateral portion of the eye, but you actually need to, you need the blinking action to transfer that across the eyelid, kind of like windscreen wipers. Um, the eyelid itself has quite a few layers to it and we'll go through those in depth. Um, and then the, the vascular supply is kind of through a bunch of different vessels. You've got the ophthalmic artery um, producing some branches and also the superficial temporal artery giving some branches. And then the venous drainage is just the opposite of that. So you get drainage into ultimately the angular and ophthalmic veins and the superficial temporal vein. Innovation we've already talked about, the upper eye. So remember, the eye is kind of the division between V1 and V2. So the upper eyelid would be from the ophthalmic nerve, and then the lower eyelid would be from the maxillary nerve. The layers that you have to know about, kind of four layers, but they're kind of a bit, I don't know, wishy-washy. You've got a thin layer of skin and subcutaneous tissue, first of all. There's very little subcutaneous fat here. And that's why the eyeball can sometimes be one of the first places that shows edema, if there's significant edema, because it's very, very thin. You also have a couple modified sweat and sebaceous glands here, which, you know, are not that important, but they have funky names. Sitting just behind that is the orbicularis oculi muscle, which is responsible for closing the eyelid. And importantly, it has three parts to it that do different things. So there's a palpebral part that gently closes the eyelid and then an orbital part that tightly closes the eyelid. So that's when you're like scrunching your eyes shut. And the lacrimal part, well, lacrimal, remember the lacrimal gland is what produces your tears. So the lacrimal part of this muscle is involved in moving those tears and draining those tears. All of that is innervated by the facial nerve because the orbicularis oculi is a muscle of facial expression. So then behind this sheet of muscle, you have the tarsal plates and the levator apparatus, which elevate. So they contract to elevate the eyelid. Um, that's sort of innervated, remember, by your ocular motor nerve. And then you have the conjunctiva. And the conjunctiva is, there's kind of two components to it, but it's continuous and it's just the th same bit reflected on itself. So you have a palpebral component, anything palpable, is relating to the eyelid. So a palpebral component and then a bulba component. So it's continuous, but it just folds back on itself. And the bulba component is the bit that's sort of reflected along the sclera of the eyeball here. Now, then we add in the gland and the gland, like I mentioned, kind of sits on this sort of lateral component and it feeds into the upper portion of the eye here. And then you get drainage of that across and then into the ducts. Um, it's really not that important to know like the arterial supply and venous drainage of the lacrimal gland, um, but you should probably know its innervation because this is a part of that COPS 3977. So there's parasympathetic innervation. Um, that's mainly that. And so this is sort of the full breakdown of that innervation and where those fibers come from. Mainly it's like, Principally, it's the facial nerve, and then it transfers through the greater petrosal nerve, um, nerve of pterygoid canal, the pterygopalatine ganglion, and then it hitchhikes along branches of trigeminal, like we mentioned, maxillary, and then eventually to the zygomatic before it finally reaches the lacrimal gland. Again, it is not important for you to know the full pathway, know the origin, know the destination, and then know the ganglion that it sort of stops in at the middle. Um, but the parasympathetic, the function of the parasympathetic innervation will be to stimulate secretions and then the sympathetic will be to inhibit secretion. You don't really want to be tearing up when you're trying to fight or fly. Um, the sympathetic innervation, it all comes from the superior cervical ganglion as with like all of the sympathetics of the head. And as with all of the sympathetics of the head, it's carried by the internal carotid plexus upwards. Um, and then from there, it kind of just follows with the parasympathetic fibers. Now, the lacrimal apparatus um, is kind of important to know about because this is, first of all, there's just a lot of terminology for various different parts of this structure, which feels kind of excessive. Um, but this is actually an important structure for draining the tears that are produced by the lacrimal gland. 
So the lacrimal fluid is sort of secreted into little ducts, which empty out into the eye via the superior conjunctival fornix. And then it gets spread across by the process of blinking. So when you blink, it actually pushes the fluid sort of medially and inferiorly. And eventually it accumulates in uh, the medial canthus of the eye, which is this sort of divot um, in what is called the lacrimal lake. So it's literally like two different words for the same thing. Um, so that's why when like you're crying and stuff like that, tears will pull there first um, because there's sort of a depression there that naturally collects the lacrimal fluid. Then there's tiny little holes here and here um, called the lacrimal puncta that drain that fluid into these little ducts, which are called the lacrimal canaliculi into this opening which is the lacrimal sac. And the lacrimal sac is the dilated end of the nasolacrimal duct, which is this whole thing. And ultimately that drains into the inferior meatus of the nasal cavity Yeah, So a lot of different names for lots of different parts of this pathway for some reason. Okay, in terms of eyeball pathologies, this, um, like you don't have to know too much detail in preclin, but you need, you need to know like the key buzzwords, I think. Um, so just having an idea of what these conditions mean um, and what kind of defects they might cause. So a glaucoma, by definition, is obstruction of the drainage of the aqueous humor. And remember, the aqueous humor fills that space in front of the lens. So normally that there's a drainage system to remove that fluid um, to prevent excess building up. And a glaucoma is obstruction of that drainage system. So you can imagine you get buildup of pressure. Now that can happen gradually or it can happen suddenly with different effects. Um, the other really common condition that you hear about is cataract and a cataract is actually like clouding and opacification of the lens. Um, and that just happens like as a consequence of old age. And you can imagine that if your lens that you see through is becoming cloudy and blurry, it's like wearing dirty glasses. Your vision becomes very blurry and impaired. The other big one that you have to know is papilledema. And papilledema is specifically swelling of the optic disc so that you can see here like on fundoscopy, the normal optic disc is kind of like fairly flat and like well-defined. When someone has raised intracranial pressure, whether that's from like a tumor, a bleed, an infection, um, one of the ways that you can spot it is papilledema on fundoscopy which is where the optic disc becomes like very dilated and inflamed looking. You don't get that nice um, differentiation that you see here. And it sort of looks very like three dimensional, like it's literally swelling. That's sort of a very bad sign because it means that there's um, severe intracranial pressure rise and actually that can cause damage to the optic nerve, which can be irreversible. So cataracts here, you can kind of see, I mean, this is like an exaggeration. You can't actually see cladding of the lens, but it is defined as like a cladding of the lens. And it's where the proteins just sort of begin to denature. I think long-term like UV exposures actually, uh, actually contributes to that because you get denaturation of the proteins in the lens and it becomes cloudy. Kind of the way egg whites become white when you cook them. Um, early on, it sort of just starts off with like slight blurring of the vision but as it progresses, the vision can become very, very blurry. Like looking through a veil is often how it's described and colors will actually distort as well to become a bit more faded and yellowish. And there's like pictorial representations of this if you do a little Google of what like looking through a cataract is like. Um, initially it's fixable with like glasses, but ultimately they end up having to replace the lens with an artificial one. And even once they replace the lens, the person will need to use glasses because you can imagine that like a plastic artificial lens can't um, stretch and sort of flatten the way your natural lens would. So they sort of have to pick. It's like either you get a lens that's gonna give you great distance vision, but you have to wear glasses to read up close, or you can pick a lens that will give you great near vision, but you have to wear glasses to see afar. Um, they kind of have to pick between the two. Diabetic retinopathy is also kind of mentioned just because it's a consequence of long-term poorly controlled diabetes. Um, you don't have to know too much about the actual like pathophys behind it, 
but know some of the key sort of buzzwords and findings that you see. Basically what happens is with long-term diabetes, um, they get like poor blood supply to various areas. So you get like strokes and peripheral vascular disease and things like that. But specifically poor oxygen delivery to the eye means that your eyeball tries to create new blood vessels in order to like increase the blood supply. So it creates all these new blood vessels, but the new blood vessels are very weak and fragile and they easily rupture. And so then you get a bit of hemorrhage, like you can see here, and eventually scarring. And scarring of the retina is very bad because you can't recover that retina. And the retina's job is to let you see. So you can imagine that this would happen in kind of a patchy distribution. So people get scotomas, which is where they have like patches of their vision that are blurry. And they might not even notice this at first because they can compensate for it by like moving their head around and their eye around. The brain's very clever and it can stitch together sort of bits and pieces to make up for visual defects, which is why you never notice your blind spot. But after a long enough period of time, they'll get quite significant visual loss to the point where they can no longer compensate. And it's permanent. It's, it's not reversible. One of, the, one of the buzzwords for diabetic retinopathy is cotton wool spots, which is kind of a sign of ischemia. And then probably the other one to know is macular degeneration, just because it's common. Um, again, don't worry too much about knowing the pathophys. I put it in here if you want to read, but you don't need to. Um, the only thing you need to know about macular degeneration is that it's loss of the central field of vision. Um, and it's because um, the macula is sort of responsible for your fine high acuity vision. So if it's damaged there, then you sort of lose that central high acuity vision and they get this, um, this kind of visual defect here, which can be quite problematic. The cause of it is actually buildup of waste products within the retina. Um, and I'll show you what that kind of looks like on fundoscopy in a sec. So this is glaucoma. Glaucoma is um, one of the main ones to know probably. And there's two kinds of glaucoma, one being much worse than the other. So the one that's more common is called open angle glaucoma. And the difference between the two is that sort of the positioning of the iris. So this is your normal drainage pathway of the aqueous humor. It kind of loops around the iris, comes here, and then it gets drained in this little corner here by the trabecular meshwork. Now, if you've just got sort of gradual clogging of this trabecular meshwork over time, it's called an open angle glaucoma. And because of that, because it's a gradual process, you get gradual loss of vision. Um, and the loss of vision happens because you get raised pressures and raised pressures in the eyeball or in any confined space of the body are very bad. So you get raised pressure here, retinal damage, and eventually some loss of peripheral vision, but it all happens very gradually. The flip side of that is closed angle glaucoma. And that's when you can see here, the iris kind of gets forced upwards, closing off this entire drainage pathway altogether and completely closing off the trabecular meshwork. So not, you're not getting like a gradual decrease in the drainage, it's a sudden occlusion. Um, that completely prevents any drainage at all. So you can imagine the pressure builds up very rapidly and it will very rapidly cause blindness. So this is actually more of an emergency. There are other types, but you don't have to worry about those. So open angle, closed angle, closed angle being bad. And then just a little note on like near and far sightedness. Um, I, the reason I threw this in is because there's a lot of exam questions about accommodation. And this was something that was also very, very confusing for me. So um, near sightedness, as you guys probably know, is called myopia and that's poor distance vision. And far sightedness is hyperopia, which is poor near vision. And the two can be caused by um, like congenital issues with the eye shape. Um, failure of the ciliary muscles causing the lens to be sort of the wrong shape or the cornea being the wrong shape. The thing that's important and high yield to know is how accommodation normally works in an eye. So when you need to see something that's close up in front of you, you need your lens to be thicker and rounder, right? Like greater focusing power. But weirdly, in order to get the lens to be thicker and rounder, 
the ciliary muscles have to contract. So the ciliary muscles are these little guys here, right? So when they contract, it actually relaxes the lens. So the lens actually becomes thicker and rounder. And there's some diagrams, if you Google it, of like kind of why that happens. And the reason is because the ciliary muscles, you picture them as a ring like this. And then the lens is kind of attached in the middle via little suspensory ligaments. When it contracts, it doesn't actually contract like this way going backwards, as you can kind of see. The ring of the muscle contracts inwards, right? And when that contracts inwards, the suspensory ligaments, they relax. And so the lens becomes more slack and thick and rounded. Whereas when the ciliary muscles relax, it actually relaxes to open more, right? Those suspensory ligaments get pulled tighter and the lens actually flattens. So when the ciliary muscles relax, you get a flatter lens and therefore you get good distance vision. So that's how normal accommodation works. Know that pathway because it comes up in a lot of questions. I think the way to think about it might be like imagine as um, the um, ciliary muscles are like spokes on a bicycle, on a bicycle wheel. Um, and so when it contracts, it kind of like pulls it in so it makes it smaller. Um, that's how I thought about it, which kind of helped. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of a weird concept because it feels very counterintuitive at first. Okay. And then let's talk a little bit about cranial nerve exam. Now, cranial nerve exam, I think, you like, first of all, you'll never get it in its entirety. Like, you'll never be asked to do a cranial exam start to finish for, like, any kind of assessment because it's excessively long. Um, and especially this year, you would never be asked to do it start to finish because you can't actually do it in person. But um, the good thing about the cranial nerve exam is that if you know the functions of each cranial nerve, you can pretty systematically work through what you have to test. So, you know, general inspection is the same as normal. You want to look for any sort of obvious deformities. Um, a lot of it is actually eye related. So if they have ptosis, the drooping of the eyelids, issues with pupil size, shape, symmetry, all of that can point to pathology. And then like hearing aids as well, indicating possibly like vestibulocochlear issues. Um, if they wear glasses, all of that. And then you sort of just go nerve by nerve. So if the first cranial nerve's function is smell, then you want to test the first cranial nerve using sense. And so, I mean, this is only done if you actually suspect that there might be an anosmia. But you block one nostril, hold up like a little vial with some kind of strong scent and ask the patient to identify the scent. Repeat on the other side. Pretty easy. Optic nerve is uh, a lot of tests. So the first one is visual acuity. Um, while you won't be asked to like do exams this year, I'm pretty sure they'll, they're going to ask you to do some clinical, like they're going to give you clinical skills questions in the written exam as sort of compensation. So know like the random, know the process for these, um, exams and also like the random intricacies, like the numbers and the details, because I have a feeling they're going to throw that in your written paper. So visual acuity should always be assessed six meters away from the Snellen chart. That's the chart with all the letters on it. You should ask them if they wear glasses because in a cranial nerve exam, they are allowed to wear their glasses. You only want to know if they have like blindness or complete visual field loss. You don't really care about, you know, how good their high acuity vision is. This is different from an eye exam. Cranial nerve exam, you just want to know, are they blind or not? <laughs> so if they wear glasses, they can wear the glasses. You have the patient cover one eye and then you ask them to read the lowest line they can see. And then you repeat with the other eye. And if you're worried that they've memorized it, you ask them to read the line backwards. And then visual acuity is expressed as a fraction. So 6'3", six, 6'6", six, 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 The numerator is six meters, so six. And then the denominator is the, the number of the lowest line that they can read. And the interpretation of that is if the patient is like 6'12", then they can see at six meters what a healthy eye can see at 12 meters. So the numerator is what they're, they're sort of standing at. And then the denominator is like the comparison to a healthy eye. So six, three would be, they can see at six meters what a healthy eye would be able to see at like three meters. So um, two incorrect letters are allowed and you can record that as like minuses next to the fraction. 
Um, you also need to test color vision, which is with the Ishihara plates. Again, glasses can be worn because you just want to know, are they like red, green colorblind? Um, and so you run through like a little booklet of the numbers and you ask them to like read out what number they see and then you record which ones are correct or the number that are correct. Um, and you do that in each eye. Then we've got all the pupil tests and there's a lot of pupil tests. So um, for one of them, you shine light into the eye and you watch for constriction of that pupil. That's the direct pupillary reflex. You also then shine it into that eye and watch for constriction of the other pupil. That's the consensual light reflex. And then there's this Marcus Gunn one as well, where you swing the torch sort of back and forth and you look for a relevant, affer a relative afferent pupillary defect, which is where um, you get paradoxical like dilation of the other pupil. So when you shine the light to one eye, it, you, you see it dilate as opposed to remaining constricted. And that indicates an optic nerve pathology. Um, accommodation, so you ask them to look at something that's far away, then you put the, your finger like right in front of their face and ask them to focus, and you watch for the pupils to constrict and converge so they go a little bit cross-eyed, that would be normal. Um, if the pupils don't constrict, it can be an issue with their ciliary muscle. Uh, visual field is kind of te testing for all those different optic nerve tract lesions. So you're sitting and sort of in front of them and you're basically testing if they can see in like each of the four quadrants, right? So that's gonna be like wiggling the fingers in each of the four quadrants. Um, it's probably best to watch like a video of these being performed because it's quite hard to sort of picture it in your head otherwise exactly how to go about it. And then the blind spot test, so you're sitting in front of the patient to have the same eye as them and you have this little like pin with a little red ball on the top and you move that across your field of vision until they can't see the tip of the red ball anymore. So this is while they're looking directly at you. And eventually when that red ball lines up perfectly with their blind spot, they won't be able to see it again. And from there, you can kind of move it up, down, left and right to map out how big the blind spot is and just compare it to yours, assuming yours is healthy. And then the last step of the eye exam or the optic nerve exam is fundoscopy. Cranial nerve three, four, and six are pretty straightforward because you just do the H shape. The bit that's not so straightforward is the interpretation of like, if they can't do one particular movement, which muscle and therefore which nerve is affected. This, this diagram here is pretty good. So it tells you exactly which muscle and which nerve is responsible for what. Um, beyond that, remember that the oculomotor nerve also has a role in pupil um, constriction. So make sure you also assess the pupil size. If one is dilated and the other is constricted, that's a, that's a problem. And then also diplopia. So diplopia is more of a symptom than a sign in that if someone has a um, cranial nerve palsy affecting their um, extraocular eye muscles, it might not present as the eye not being able to move or the eye being in a weird position at rest. It might present in the patient seeing double. So to test for diplopia, you hold up a, pa a finger and you ask how many the patient sees. So it's the classic thing of like, how many fingers am I holding up? Um, usually like, usually even if they have a bit of diplopia, they'd be able to tell you how many fingers you're actually holding up, but it's more like how many fingers do you see? Um, if they do see multiple to work out which eye it is, you'd have to sort of cover each eye. And when the affected eye is covered, the diplopia will go away because your healthy eye is going to see exactly how many fingers you're meant to see. Um, if you need to determine which muscle, and this is getting like very specific, you do the H and whichever movement of the sort of abduction, adduction, up and down of each um, has the images furthest apart that's going to be the muscle that's responsible because that muscle, that particular muscle is paralyzed in one eye. And so you're going to get maximal diplopia when you try to use that muscle. Okay. Sensation um, for your trigeminal nerve. You basically like touch in each of the three areas of the distribution and see if they can feel it. But there's also a specific one, the corneal reflex, um, which is where you lightly touch the cornea 
with a bit of cotton wool and the patient should blink. This is actually simultaneously a test of trigeminal and facial because you need trigeminal in order to feel the cotton wool, but you need facial nerve in order to actually blink. So it kind of does both. Um, then you also have to remember the motor component of the trigeminal nerve, so the muscles of mastication, clenching the teeth and feeling the masseters, opening the mouth against resistance, and looking for if they open their mouth, if there's any like deviation of the jaw or asymmetry. There's also the jaw jerk reflex, um, which would indicate an upper motor neuron. So remember, upper motor neuron lesions um, result in hyperreflexia. So people have more exaggerated reflexes. So the jaw jerk reflex is normally not present or very minimal. And it's where you basically like tap over the chin like this with the patient's mouth open and relaxed. And if you get this massive sort of jerk, um, that's hyperreflexia and therefore an upper motor neuron lesion. Facial nerve, the taste component is pretty straightforward. You ask them if they've had any taste issues. The motor component, you basically run through a bunch of facial expressions. So the frontalis muscle runs along sort of the forehead here, the frontal bone, and that's, in, um, that's responsible for raising the eyebrows. So you get them to raise their eyebrows and don't let you sort of push them back down. That's a test of frontalis. Um, orbicularis ocular, remember, is sort of a circular muscle that wraps around the eye like this. So you get them to squeeze their eyes shut, and that would be orbicularis ocular. There's orbicularis oris, which kind of runs around the mouth area. So they puff out their cheeks, and that would be a test of that. And then smiling wide is a test of levator angular oris, which kind of runs up like this and zygomaticus major, which also runs in this sort of oblique direction to smile. So you just test each of those facial expressions and if they can do them, they probably don't have facial paralysis. The hearing tests um, are a little bit more complicated. So you start off with like a general kind of hearing test, which is where you have a look around, you press around on the ear and stuff, and then you block each ear one at a time and whisper numbers into the opposite ear. 52, 76, and you ask the patient to repeat back to you. So that's just sort of a general test in each ear. But then we have the more sort of specific technical tests. So Rinase is one of them. And Rinase is basically, it serves to compare bone conduction, so conduction of sound through the bone, the mastoid process, versus air conduction, which would be conduction through the air and then through the actual auditory canal. So you flick the tuning fork, place it on the mastoid process, ask them to tell you when they can no longer hear it. And when they can no longer hear it, you flip it around so that it's near their ear and you ask them if they can hear it again. The terminology is confusing. If they can hear it again, it's a positive Rene's test and a positive Rene's test is normal. Then you have a Weber's test. And the Weber's test, you flick the tuning fork and you put it on the center of the head like this, or even just the center of the forehead. And you ask the patient if they can hear it and if they can hear it equally in both ears. This is not a very specific test because even in normal people, they will often be able to hear it louder in one ear over the other. But that's why you have to interpret the two tests sort of together to work out if there's a hearing defect. That's all like the cochlear component of the nerve, right? So if you need to specifically test the vestibular component, that's the whole pike maneuver. You would never be asked to do it because apparently it's kind of like intense for the patient. Um, but you basically like lie the patient down so the head is hanging off the edge of the bed and you support it as it goes down. And then you like grab the head and you turn it to one side. And if the patient starts to feel dizzy or like feel like the room is spinning or they're going to fall over um, or they have nystagmus and the eyes start like flickering, that's, that's an indication that there's damage to the vestibular component. And that would be a positive hall pike maneuver. So normally a positive um, exam finding is abnormal, which is why it's weird that in Rene's positive is normal. So this is interpretation of Rene's and Weber's because there's a lot of exam questions around this as well. It's a very easy thing to examine. Um, so to, the main thing to understand, first of all, is that you can have two types of hearing loss. It can be conductive, which I always think of as like a giant chunk of earwax blocking the ear canal. Um, and that's going to impair like conduction of sound through the ear canal, right? Or you can have a sensory neural hearing loss, which is where the nerves are damaged. 
so that the sound is making its way through the ear, but when it reaches the nerve, the nerve doesn't get triggered. So you can't hear. Now, Rene's is great for telling you what kind of hearing loss there is because it's really good at picking up conductive hearing loss. If someone has a conductive hearing loss, their air conduction is going to be worse than their bone conduction because there's a giant blockage in the way. So when you flick it and you put it on the mastoid process, they hear it, they stop hearing it, you turn it around and they still can't hear anything. That tells you that there's a conductive hearing loss. If it's normal, if they still can hear something, it's probably going to be a normal or sensory neural hearing loss. Um, so if the, if the air conduction is better than bone, but there's a hearing defect, it's sensory neural. And then you can tell which side it is based on Weber's. So Weber's is really best for telling you which side the hearing loss is in. So if you have a sensory neural hearing loss, you can imagine that when you put it up here, that ear is just like knocked out. So the sound lateralizes to the healthy, unaffected ear. In conductive hearing loss, when you've got a giant chunk of the earwax sitting in the way blocking it, weirdly the earwax like conducts the sound better. So in a conductive hearing loss, when you do weavers, the sound will be louder in the affected ear. Okay. I think if you're struggling to remember the way I remember it is if you can like hum, you can like hum to yourself and you can like shut one of your ears and you can hear the sound actually go towards the bad ear. So if you ever forget, just do that in the exam. And, that will, and then it will be the opposite for sensory neural. Yeah. So that simulates the obstruction. When you press on your ear and you hum, it actually lateralizes to the blocked ear. Um, and so that would be in the case of conductive hearing loss. This little table is kind of, if you want to memorize, if you're a memorizer, this would be the way to memorize it. But I think understanding the reasoning behind the lateralizing and also the air conduction versus bone conduction will help you work out what kind of hearing loss someone has depending on the results of those tests. And then to finish off, so cranial nerve nine and 10, glossopharyngeal and vagus, um, you ask them if they've noticed any problems with swallowing, because remember that innervates like your, the back of the throat muscles, speaking, coughing, listening for a hoarse voice. And then you want to open the mouth and look for uvula displacement. And remember it, de it deviates to the side, sorry, away from the side of the lesion. So if it's pointing to the left, you're looking for like a right cranial nerve palsy. Um, when the patient says, ah, you should look for the soft palate to elevate. That's like the levator something. I can't remember the name of that muscle. Um, and then you can also test for the gag reflex. And so you poke the back of the throat and the patient should gag. That's actually a test of both cranial nerve nine and 10, because you've got to test the sensory component to actually detect the stimuli and the motor component to, to actually cause the gagging. Um, the accessory nerve is very easy to test for. Shrug the shoulders while you're pushing down for trapezius. Turn the head while you're pushing against it for sternocleidomastoid. And then cranial nerve 12, the test is having a look at the tongue. So they stick out their tongue. If there's obvious asymmetry, wasting of fasciculations, that's obviously a problem. And characteristically, you're looking for a deviation towards the side of the lesion. So this here would be a left hypoglossal lesion because the tongue is deviating to the left when the person pokes out their tongue. Um, I've put the specifics of the eye exam here, but it's basically the optic nerve exam um, with a couple little changes. So there's, because this is specifically the eye exam, you look for a couple more things on general inspection. You also palpate, which you don't do in the cranial nerve exam. So palpating, you literally just like press over the eye um, around sort of the bony margins and stuff like that to see if there's any tenderness. You pull the lids down and up to look for your anemia and jaundice as you usually would. You also look for styes. Um, you inspect the tear duct punctum. So remember the tiny little holes um, in the top and bottom portion of the medial canthus here where your tears will drain to. You can actually see if they're obstructed and blocked. And if there's suspicion of a foreign body, you can evert the eyelid um, with a Q-tip, but you should only do that if there's suspicion of a foreign body because it's kind of unpleasant. And basically what you do is you hold the upper eyelid, you get a Q-tip and you lightly put pressure on the, on the eyelid and the eyelid will like flip 
and evert. So you can see if there's foreign bodies and you can even remove foreign bodies. The rest of the visual tests are basically the same, but the main difference is that you actually care about visual acuity here, right? You're not just looking for blindness, you're looking for how good the vision is. So it has to be tested corrected and uncorrected without, with and without glasses. Um, and you do each eye one at a time, but in terms of like, like this is just a weird specific thing, but if they're being tested for like driving um, and their ability to drive, you also have to do binocular testing. Because with driving, the requirements are that even if one eye is really bad, as long as you can see okay with both eyes, you can still drive. Then you do color vision, the pupils, accommodation, visual fields, blind spots, all of that stuff the same way as for the optic nerve exam. And then fundoscopy. Fundoscopy, I mean, even when OSCEs were a real thing in person, was highly unlikely to be a station. So it's almost no yield at this point. But again, they will probably ask you like random specific questions in the written paper to make sure that you haven't neglected clin skills. So the key points to remember is that you should um, conduct an eye exam when you're doing fundoscopy in a dark room and the glasses obviously need to be removed so you have access to the eye. And you want it to be dark because you want the pupil to dilate as much as possible because you can't actually see if someone's got a tiny constricted pupil. You need to be able to see through the pupil, through that space, to the back of the eye. Then you can artificially dilate the eye um, with tropicamide. Um, and then th if you're using tropicamide, you have to warn them that they like can't, they shouldn't drive afterwards for a little portion or something like that um, because it keeps the pupil dilated for a little while. In terms of the actual process, I've put all the notes here if you would like to have a look. But basically you start far away, low magnification with the light on and you look for something called the red reflex. Then you sort of slowly move closer, increasing the magnification to look through the different layers of the eye. You probably don't really have to know too much about that this year. The other thing that they like to assess is like the different features on a fundoscope and like what they're best for assessing. So you can change it to have like a smaller aperture, so a smaller sort of beam of light, which is good for if you're looking through a small pupil or a larger aperture to have more light. And then there's also like specific lights. So there's a green one, which if you use, will turn, um, will make blood vessels and hemorrhages look black. So it's very good for picking up blood vessels. Um, and then there's a slit beam, which like I would not worry about like at all in terms of the intricacies of what it does, but it's good for anterior chamber depth, which would be helpful for assessing glaucoma. That's all you have to know. Um, in terms of like what you actually see on fundoscopy, this is what you should see. I say should because it's very hard to ever actually see that on a fundoscope. Um, but this is what it should look like. You should see some normal sort of clear blood vessels. Um, the optic disc here looking pretty flat and well-defined. The fovea or the macula, which is that high density, high acuity vision. Um, and sort of minimal other random exudates, right? It's pretty sort of clear. You compare that to this picture here for diabetic retinopathy. You can see that there's kind of like, there's a lot of random tortuous small kind of vessels. That would be the new vessels that formed. You've got little white patches that are ischemic. That's cotton wool spots. And then you also get like little exudates, little white patches everywhere. This one here, that's papilledema. So you can see the normal little optic disc is all swollen and bulging and doesn't look clearly defined at all. That's a sign of raised intracranial pressure, very bad. And then this one is actually macular degeneration. So you just get like accumulation of random stuff under the retina that obscures your vision. Ear exam. This is like in decreasing order of yield, by the way. <laughs> um, you inspect around the ear, have a look if they're using a hearing aid. They love mentioning that for some reason. And then you, same as with the ear, you just kind of have a little press around and see if there's any pain. And you also feel the lymph nodes in the area, see if they're enlarged. And then the main bulk of it is the speculum. And so um, the main thing is that they love telling you, you have to put like your two fingers as a buffer. 
So this, the otoscope, I'm not sure if you've ever seen one. It's kind of like a long pointy looking thing, which is kind of scary because if you imagine pushing that into your ear, like you can pierce the tympanic membrane if you push too hard, which would be catastrophic. So you have to like put two fingers, press two fingers sort of against the ear here as a sort of buffer so that you can't actually push the otoscope too far in. Then you have a look around and this is what you should see in like an ideal world um, where there is no hair and wax in the way. And you're looking for the tympanic membrane and you're looking to see like, first of all, is there any perforation? Um, but also are there any foreign bodies? Is there any like fluid, blood or pus building up behind the tympanic membrane, which would be quite bad. And this, the cone of light, just indicates that the tympanic membrane is sort of normal and healthy and not swollen. Um, and then you do all of the sort of hearing tests that you did for the um, vestibular cochlear nerve in the cranial nerve exam. So the whispering, the Rene's and the Weaver's. Throat exam is lucky last, literally the lowest of yield. Um, yes, you can have a read if you would like. It's really not that important. You just kind of look around at everything, feel sort of around um, as well, like the like you squeeze the tongue and the salivary glands to feel for any like hard lumps or growths and you do the cervical lymph nodes. Check if the muscles are kind of moving the right way, the tongue and the uvula, and that's about it. I don't think the throat exam would be an Oski. <laughs> All right, that's it. That's me. Let me stop sharing. Any questions about that? All right. Um, we're going to super quickly do embryology before we take a lunch break. Um, yeah, I am going to be super quick because I know you guys have already been going for almost two hours now. So I don't want to sit here for longer. You don't want to sit here for longer. Let's make it good for everyone. Um, so I'll share my screen. Um, embryology isn't that bad. Like there's only very specific things they really ask you about. Um, but there's always like uncertainty because like who knows what they could ask for embryos. There's really so much stuff. Um, but we'll try and focus on the main things. Um, oh, that's not the right button, isn't it? Um, I don't know what I've done. Am I frozen? No, you're all good. Yeah, you're okay. fine. But the screen doesn't, I don't know what's happening there. Yeah, my screen's done something. Maybe I'll yeah. retry it. Um, but yeah, we'll be super quick. <laughs> I think we're roughly here. Okay. How's that? Yep, that's good. Okay, sweet. Um, so there's a few major things that will probably three big topics in embryology or main topics that we'll focus on. The first being pharyngeal arches, the second being thyroid and mouth development, tongue development, and then the third being like facial development. Um, and you really just have to know the core concepts um, and the big buzzwords. Um, so we'll start off with pharyngeal arches. Um, actually, we'll start off with a summary. <laughs> um, so basically this is all happening in week four to eight. So first you're getting your pharyngeal apparatus being forming, then you got your ears forming, and then you've got kind of the eyes and the facial structure forming. Um, from week eight and beyond um, and we'll go through it in that order they actually do sometimes ask about like which week specific things are happening um, so that's always a good thing to know um, and this is all happening after we've done our like notochord development and spinal cord development um, that we talked about probably last year actually um, so this is all happening after that um, okay so we'll talk about pharyngeal apparatus first. So basically the pharyngeal apparatus is 
um, basically the most superior portion of um, the gut tube. It's connected to the gut tube. And that makes sense because our mouth um, and like our pharynx and all those structures connect to our throat, um, connect to our GRT tract um, and whatsoever. Um, and this is all going to become basically our future face, head and neck. Um, just like at the anus where there's um, a, where we go from endoderm switching to ectoderm at the very end um, in the anal canal. Um, we have the same thing at the mouth. So we're switching from endoderm to ectoderm. Um, and that's at the divide we call the oropharyngeal membrane, um, which is just a word you need to know. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much all you need to know from that slide. Um, this is a nice picture to put it all in context. So this is like the baby Kainata's head. This is its tail. The gut tube is somewhere in here. Um, and then heart bulge is coming and our um, pharyngeal arches are going to develop kind of in that neck region, um, kind of along that gut tube tract. Um, cool. That's all you need to know there. Um, okay. Pharyngeal arches, clefts, and pouches. Um, so this is this is what we're looking at, this structure, and we're going to take a cross section at this line, um, and this is what we're going to get. We're going to see sort of these beady looking structures um, along each one. So there's about six, well, five really, but we number them one to six. Um, and we've got arches. So this is the entire sort of structure here. We've got the clefts. Um, which is the invaginations of ectoderm. So that's on the outside where they're going in and out and in and out. So those are the invaginations of the ectoderm, which is lining the outside. We've got the mesoderm on the inside. We've got our nerve, artery, and cartilage, which are all forming um, alongside that mesoderm. And then we've got the pharyngeal pouches, which are the evaginations coming from the internal surface. Um, and that's just for naming conventions. And so we can describe things um, and where things are going to come out of because um, things are going to be developing from these pouches, things are going to be developing from these clefts, and things are going to be developing from the actual arches. Um, okay, that's all you need to know there. And we name it like superior to inferior. So one is the most superior, six is the most inferior, um, and it's numbered accordingly. Cool. Um, that over there. Okay. Um, yeah, so we've sort of talked about this. The pharyngeal arches are made separated um, from one another by the pouches and the clefts, um, which makes sense. And then we've got the structural components. So we've got our skeletal and cartilage tissue, which is originating from our mesoderm, um, as well as the muscular tissue. So that's consistent with everything we've learned so far. And then we've got our sensory and motor tissue, which is going to be um, also originating from there, as well as the arch arteries. So there's one main artery really associated with most of the arches um, that we need to know about. Cool. So we we'll talk about each of the arches one by one. Um, I think it's probably best to learn about it in terms of nerves. Um, so arch one is associated with trigeminal nerve. Um, and we know the trigeminal nerve is associated mainly with sensation, but it's also got some motor action as Lena was saying. So it's got, um, it's, a, it's function is to innovate the muscles of mastication. Um, there's also some bony, bony, bony tissue um, and cartilage that's going to develop from it. Um, I don't think that's super important to know, but I guess if you're putting it in context, um, it's sort of your mandibular area, sorry, maxillary area um, and kind of the upper mandible. Um, and as you go through the arches, they kind of, um, uh, each portion is creates, I guess, more inferior parts of the head and neck. Um, yeah, so arch one, trigeminal nerve, muscles of mastication, and then we've got the maxillary artery, um, which is the associated artery. Arch two, we've got ooh, the facial nerve, um, and associated with facial nerve are going to be the muscles of facial expression, um, as well as um, some of the inner ear bones and the upper hyoid bones. So as we we're saying, like the um, Trigeminal nerve stuff is kind of in this area, upper ear, um, maxilla area. Um, arch two is kind of be more in the lower ear along the mandible, um, which makes sense. This artery you don't really need to know about, to be honest. 
Um, then we've got the glossopharyngeal nerve. Um, so it's associated again with a little bit lower. It's got that hyoid, hyoid, hyoid bone down the bottom underneath the um, mandible, um, as well as a stylopharyngeus muscle. I think Alina was talking about it before, but I can't remember. Um, yeah, so, and as we said before, the, the, the nerves are kind of going in order five, seven, nine, like it's going down the numbers basically. So that also kind of makes sense. Cool. So then we've got arch four and six. So this is coming from the vagus nerve, so number 10. Um, and then we've got two different parts of the vagus nerve so that we need to think about. So the superior laryngeal nerve and the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So superior laryngeal nerve is associated with arch four. Um, recurrent laryngeal nerve is associated with arch six. Um, and these are associated with our laryngeal muscles and our pharyngeal and laryngeal cartilages. Um, and then we've got an arch five, but that's only in like and stuff that has gills. So we don't have that. So we don't think about that. Um, and then we've got also our associated um, artery. So for arch four, um, we've got the right to play in the area arch. And then for arch six, the ductus arterius and pulmonary artery. Um, I don't think that's that important to know, but it's there if you need it. Um, cool. This is all kind of kind of rote learning, but there's not too much to really rote learn here. Just understand the basic concepts. Um, yep, this is a diagrammatic um, visual picture of all of that. Um, if you're a visual learner um, or if you want it in words, then look at the table below before. Yeah, just have a look at that. Try and absorb it as much as you can. The intricacies aren't that important, just like the nerves, the general muscles, and like the general bones and like where they are roughly. Um, and this is kind of another picture um, just to highlight, but we can also see that um, the, the clefts, which are kind of over here, um, and the pouches are also gonna turn into certain things. Uh, and we'll talk about that after. Um, but this kind of puts it into context. Um, I think one important fact that they told us about, which kind of makes sense to me as well now, is that because the trigeminal one, the tri power, the arch number one is going to be developing first, it's going to move up into your um, primordial head and neck first. So it's going to be kind of the base layer. Um, and the facial muscles of facial expression are going to move up after that. So they're going to go on top of your muscles of mastication. And so your, your facial muscles are all going to be superficial, basically, um, to your um, muscles of mastication. That's why you can kind of see them more visibly when you're making facial expressions. Um, but that's just like a fact to know kind of thing. Um, cool. Yeah. Okay. So clefts and pouches, what are they all turning into? Um, so the first clef and pouch, they're going to, kind of merge together and form your um, your tim, your sort of, what are they called? Ear canal. Um, and that's gonna be going from your ear um, into the pharynx. Um, and so we've got ectoderm on one side near towards the, I guess, superficial part of the ear. And we've got the endoderm near the pharynx and that's separated by the tympanic membrane, which is basically um, mesoderm. It's that mesoderm in between that kind of thins out. Um, Pouch two, that's going to form your palatine tonsil, so lymphatic tissue, basically. Um, and cleft two is going to fuse with cleft three and four and form your smooth neck. So there's going to be basically nothing there. It's just going to be smooth skin um, and tissue. Um, so that's kind of easy to note, um, which means all we need to really talk about now is pouches from here on out. So your third pouch uh, is going to become your inferior thyroid gland and thymus, um, and that's going to move below the fourth pouch. So the inferior thyroid gland is going to develop above um, our superior thyroid gland and then it's going to move below it to make it actually inferior at the very end. Um, and then the fourth pouch is going to turn into a superior thyroid gland, which is going to stay there. But because the inferior one is moving below it, it's going to, that's why it gets its name, the superior um, thyroid gland. Cool. Okay. This is a picture which puts it all together. Um, again, it's nothing new. It's everything I've already said in a picture form. Um, yeah, sweet. All right, so that's pharyngeal arches. Um, good, any questions? I know that was really quick, but really it's about focusing on the core concepts here. 
Um, and I know, like, as Alina said before, there's a lot of detail in all of these slides. You don't need to know it in that much detail. It's there if you want to learn it. Um, but really just listen out for what, what you need to focus on, the main things, the main ideas, and that will set you through. Cool. Okay, tongue development. That's also happening in week four. So week four is a big week, a lot of things happening. Um, if you have to guess what, like, if they ask you when is something happening, when does this happen, when does that happen, like week four is a pretty good guess. Um, and this is also developing from our pharyngeal apparatus. So while all that other stuff was happening, this is also going to be happening. Um, so we'll think about it in basically different parts of the tongue, and this will kind of explain why we're getting certain innervations. So our um, arch one and two, that's going to form basically um, the anterior two thirds of the tongue, and our posterior um, one third of the tongue is going to be formed from arch three, from a part we call the copula. Um, and that's why we're going to get different um, innovations of it. So our anterior two thirds are going to be of the tongue are going to be innovated by our lingual nerve, which is our um, part of our trigeminal nerve. So it makes sense. It's associated with arch one and two. Uh, sorry, arch one. But we're also going to have um, the facial nerve coming along from um, arch two, and that's going to provide only the sensory fibers um, through our quarter tympani that we were talking about before. Um, and that's going to give us our special sensory taste to the anterior two thirds of the tongue. The posterior one third of the tongue is a bit easier. It's all coming from arch three. That's why it's going to be only glossopharyngeal nerve innervating it. And it's going to get that taste sensation as well as that general um, sensory sensation um, at the back posterior third of the tongue from only the glossopharyngeal nerve. Um, and then at the extremely posterior of the tongue, so at the very back of your throat where you've got your epiglottis, um, that's going to come from arch six, which is the vagus nerve. And that's also going to do a general and special sensation. Um, this is another picture to put it into context. Um, so as I was saying before, um, actually this is probably a better picture. So we've got our lingual swellings, which are going to become like this. They're going to become the tongue over here. We've got our copula from arch three, um, which is going to become posterior third of the tongue over here. Um, and then we've got the most posterior part of the tongue, which is arch six. I don't think it's shown there, but it will become the epiglottis basically. Um, and I think one of the big things to note is the divide, dividing, um, I guess, structure between the anterior two thirds and the posterior one third. And that's what we call the foramen cecum. And that's like a really important structure. We'll talk about it like probably next couple of slides, um, but just keep that in mind as we go forward. Um, cool. Um, this says the same things that I've said already. Um, in another diagram. So we've got our tongue here, we've got our anterior two thirds, we've got our posterior one third, and we've got our foramen cecum, which divides it. Um, there's also a terminal sulcus, which is basically the line, the foramen cecum is like a point along the line. And we've got our median sulcus, which is dividing our two halves of the tongue. Um, so as I said before, our anterior two thirds are gonna be cranial nerve five, cranial nerve seven, um, for general sensory and special sensory respectively. Then our posterior third is going to be glossopharyngeal for both, and our vagus is going to be extreme posterior for both. Okay, musculature of the tongue, um, not too much to know, um, but hypoglossus nerve, except for all of the intrinsic muscles, except for palatoglossus. Um, and that's going to be coming from your post otic somites. Uh, if you remember way back from year one, post somites are just basically mesodermal structures, they're intermediate mesoderm. Um, that just basically form muscle and cartilage and things like that. Um, yep. Next. Cool. After that, we've got thyroid development to talk about. Um, so this is kind of going to be happening week 3.5, kind of week four. It moves into week four as well. Um, but basically, um, we've got our thyroid diverticulum, um, which is kind of another swelling, I guess, if you want to think about it, which is going to um, turn into our glandular tissue into the thyroid. And that's going to start um, at the division between the anterior two thirds and the posterior one third of the tongue. Um, as it develops, as it gets bigger and bigger, it's going to migrate inferiorly. So it's going to move down into our throat where the thyroid sits. So we remember um, from anatomy, thyroid sits around the trachea. 
um, in that neck region. So it's going to have to move down from the tongue region um, into that neck region. So it's migrating inferiorly. It goes anterior to the um, hyoid bone. So our neck bone is going moving in front of that because it's going to remember it's going to wrap around in front of it when we feeling the thigh we feel in front. So like it's going to be on top of it basically. That's the way to remember it. Um, and it leaves that depression in the tongue, the forum and cecum. Um, because it's moving down, it's kind of creating a duct along, along the path that it's moving. We call that the thyroglossal duct. Um, and in most people that, that, that gets obliterated, it doesn't, it disappears. Um, but some people it can stay and some people it forms a remnant um, pyramidal or third lobe of the thyroid. Um, this is a picture to highlight it. So tongue, anterior two thirds, posterior one third. Forum and cecum, so the thyroid diverticulum, it's, it's developing and developing, and then it's moving along, moving down, 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 anterior to the hyoid, anterior to our thyroid, cricoid cartilage, and trachea, and it's going to sit here and wrap around finally. Um, this is another picture to show the same thing, I guess. Um, yeah, that's what you need to know about it. Um, and you can basically, if you get remnants of the thyroglossal duct, you can get cysts forming anywhere along this track. So it can form here, it can form there, it can form there, it can form there, anywhere. Um, pretty much if we get that thyroglossal duct remaining. Um, this is what a cyst would look like, I guess. Um, I'm not really sure why I put these pictures in, to be honest, but <laughs> yeah, that's the same thing. Um, cool. Okay, last part, facial and palatine development. Any questions? Nope. Okay. Week four to eight. So this is where we're getting our facial um, and basically our major facial um, feature development. Um, again, starting in week four, that's the magic number, week four. Um, and this is going to take a lot more time than the other things, but it's going to basically be continuing to go on. Um, and it's going to form from five major structures. So we've got one frontonasal prominence, two maxillary prominences, and two mandibular prominences. And as the name suggests, they're kind of in the regions that they're talking about. Um, and they're all going to basically fuse together to form our facial features. So we'll talk about them each one by one. So first, the frontal nasal prominence. So I don't know if you guys can see this picture, but it's basically all of this part is the frontonasal prominence. It's basically like most of the head from um, the nose and eyes upwards. Um, and we start by getting these nasal placodes, which form, so there's two nasal placodes, which form on either side. Um, and they're basically big, big lumps on either side of the face. Um, and that's happening in week five. In week six, we get a depression in the middle, which we call the nasal pit. Um, and it's basically gonna form like the hole in our nose, like the hole in our nose that we use to smell and stuff. Um, so we get a hole in each of them forming. Um, and we can divide these nasal placodes into two um, parts. So we've got a medial part and a lateral part. Um, as the weeks go by, these medial parts are gonna to fuse together um, and they're gonna become like the middle of our nose. So the septum, um, the philtrum and the primary palate. So the top part of our mouth, the upper shelf. Um, that's what the medial um, nasal prominences are gonna form. Um, that's happening in week seven. If we don't get that, we're gonna get a cleft lip um, which makes sense because it's forming the upper part of the lip. Um, and then our lateral nasal prominences, they're not going to fuse because they're on either side, but they're going to form the ala of the nose. So they're going to form like the two little wingy skin parts on the side um, of either septum. Um, and they're also going to form the nasal lacrimal groove. So that little between the maxillary prominence and the medial na the lateral nasal prominence is basically what we call the um, nasolacrimal groove. Um, and if we fail to fuse that, then we get an oblique facial cleft. So oblique because it's on the sides more so than medial. Um, yeah, cool. Okay, maxillary prominences. So this is under our nasal pro, nasal, frontonasal prominences. This is kind of the top part in the maxilla area as the name suggests. Um, it's forming from our arch one um, and it's gonna form the secondary palate. So this is kind of the upper shelf again. So primary palate, this front part was formed from the nose, um, the frontonasal prominence. This secondary palate is gonna be forming from our maxillary prominence. Um, and if it doesn't fuse properly, 
then we're going to get our uvula not formed because that's also being formed here, as well as a cleft palate, which makes sense. Um, I think this is actually kind of important to know because I think they actually asked a question about this. What goes through the incisive foramen or something like that? And I had no idea. Um, and it was literally just a random guess. But basically, there's a foramen that's going to be um, forming in between um, this prim primary palate and secondary palate when they are um, joining together. Um, and you're going to get some nerves and arteries going through there. And that's called the nasopalatine and the nasopalatine nerve and the sternopalatine arteries. Um, so I guess just wrote, learn that because they actually asked about it once, um, which is crazy. Okay, um, moving on. Um, this is a picture just to highlight that. So again, we've got our two maxillary prominences they're coming together, they're coming together, they're coming together, and they're going to form our secondary palate. So you can't kind of see that because it's, I guess, hidden by the primary palate in front, but they're kind of behind there fused together. Okay. And then our last one, the mandibular prominence. So this is also coming from arch one, but the lower part of arch one and is going to form a mandible in the base of the oral cavity. Um, if this one, so basically this part has to enlarge as we're um, developing. If it doesn't enlarge enough, then our tongue doesn't come down. It gets stuck up in our, in the region of our primary palate and our secondary palate and things, those palates won't, won't meet if our tongue's in the way. Um, and that, that can also lead to a cleft palate. Um, so there's more than one cause of cleft palate and cleft lip and all that kind of stuff. All right, that was the end. That was a whirlwind. Um, any questions? Cool. Okay, hi everyone. Welcome back to Hit and Nick. Um, hopefully we'll cover the rest of the topic in two hours. Um, see how we go. So yeah, this is the rough outline um, of how I'm gonna run through everything. Um, we'll start with the head in general, um, go into the neck in general, and then we'll talk about the vasculature and the whole head and neck and all the nerves in the whole head and neck. Um, and then we'll move on to um, the structures. So your upper respiratory tract and pharynx basically. Um, so running from your ear, your nose, um, your mouth, your pharynx and your larynx. Cool, so the head, starting with the bony bits. Um, yep, the skull is essentially a whole bunch of bones um, joined by sutures, um, which is a type of fibrous joint, um, which fuses together in adulthood. You have your neurocranium, um, which is neuro, so like by your brain, and you have your viscerocranium, so that's your face, your face bones. Appreciate, stolen from Gavin. Um, so yeah, this is kind of, yeah, come back to the slide later, I reckon we'll go through everything one by one now. So this is your neurocranium, you have eight bones, um, four midline and two bilateral. Um, yeah, you have your roof, which is also your calvarium, and you have your floor, so your basi cranium. Um, and the, it's made up of the frontal bone in the front, your sphenoid, which kind of runs through your center inside there, your ethmoid, which makes up a lot of your nose, your parietal bones on your outside, your temporal bones by your temples and by your ear, and your occipital bone at the back. This is your frontal bone in the blue here. Um, it's at the front. And the main thing you have to know about this is the glabella tap. Um, so people with Parkinson's, um, usually when you tap on their glabella like that, the normal reflex is to blink. And then when you stop, oh, well, when, when you continue to do that, they'll stop blinking because they get used to it. In Parkinson's, patients will continue to blink. And that's all you really have to know. There's not much to know um, about the frontal bone. This is your parietal bone. So these make up your sides. There are two and they're joined. This is your occipital bone um, in the purple and that's um, at the base of your skull. This is your ethmoid bone. Um, so that's over here. You can see that it's lining the inside of your nose. Um, you can just see it poking through by the orbit there. Um, yeah, I've got a slide on this. Yes, um, I think the most important thing about this would be the cribriform plate. 
So you can see that it, that's right there and it forms the boundary between your nose or your nasal cavity um, and your cranium. Um, it's got holes over here like that for your olfactory nerve or CN1 fibers. Um, and it also has this crista galli, which is where your false cerebri or your dura mater attaches. Um, yep, um, you've also got the foramen cecum for emissary veins. Other than that, you, you don't have to know a lot about this. I think also important to note though is the connections it makes. So like I said before, um, between your nose and your um, cranial cavity, um, you have your copriform plate, which means that if this is broken, you can get CSF leak or, um, into your nose and that causes a nasal drip. Um, you also have a connection to your orbit here. So um, yeah, so basically fractures and things can travel between the two. This is your sphenoid in the yellow here. You can see that it makes up a lot of the back of your orbit. Um, you've got a sphenoid sinus here near the back of your nose, and it also makes up um, the side of your head here. So this is located in the middle cranial fossa, and it's got a body, two lesser wings, two greater wings, and pterygoid processes over here in the yellow. Um, the cella tersica um, is a depression and that contains the pituitary gland. Um, so that's quite important, but that's basically all you have to know about it. Um, you also have the chiasmatic groove kind of here, and that's where your optic nerve is sitting or your optic chiasm. Um, and you can see that your optic nerve can travel through there. Um, so those are the things in the body. With the lesser wing, so this guy here, that forms the division between the anterior and middle cranial fossa. And it also borders the optic canal over here with the body of the sphenoid. For your greater wing, um, this is where a lot of your foramen are. So foramen rotundum here, you have V2, foramen ovale, V3, foramen spinosum for the middle meningeal vessels. And it also provides some attachment for other things, um, which aren't so important. For the pterygoid processes, um, you have the medial and the lateral plates. Um, for the medial plate, it has the pterygoid hamulus right here. Um, and that acts, a pull, acts as a pulley for the tensor villi palatini or TVP, um, as well as an attachment for the pterygomandibular raph. Um, so we'll come to those things later. The lateral plate um, has attachment of the medial and lateral pterygoid muscles which are used in mastication. Um, and you also have the pterygoid canal, uh, which opens into pterygopalatine fossa. Again, we might cover that a bit later. This is your temporal bone, um, forms the side of your head. Um, and the most important thing about this would be this right here, which is your external acoustic meatus or where your um, external auditory canal is. It's got a couple parts. So if you've got your squamous part, that's where your temporalis muscle attaches. So you can kind of feel it if you um, chew um, with your fingers on the side of your head. Um, you've got your zygomatic process. So this bit kind of forms your cheekbone um, and also has attachment of the masseter muscle. You have the tympanic part, so tympanic for air, so that's where your external auditory meatus is. Um, and it also articulates with the head of the mandible or your jaw to form your TMJ or temporomandibular joint. Um, the styloid process is here, and this is mainly for some muscular attachments. So your stylomandibular ligament of your TMJ and your styloglossus muscle, so that's um, attached to your tongue. And then you have your petromastoid. The most important part about this part would be your mastoid air cells. Um, and that comes up quite a lot. Um, yeah, I think that's it. So again, for your neurocranium, you can see for your roof here, there are only a couple things to know. Um, you should know about the sutures. So you have your coronal suture by the front. You have your sagittal suture in the middle. 
And I kind of think sagittal, um, kind of like the sagittal cut, or you think like, you know, like Sagittarius is like the, the bow and arrow, which moves this way. Um, yeah, sagittal. And then landoid um, you have at the back. Um, and then you've kind of got where these sutures join. So bregma at the front and landa at the back. Another important point is your terion. Um, and that's the point of connection between your frontal bone, your parietal bone, your temporal bone, and your sphenoid, kind of on the side of your head here. Um, and that's because your middle meningeal artery runs under here. So trauma can cause an extradural hem hematoma. So when they say like a blow to the side of the head, um, someone loses consciousness, it's really serious. Think Terion. Um, this is your neurocranium floor or basic cranium. Again, we've kind of been through these with Alina, so I won't touch on them too much um, with the cranial foramina. Um, although I think I do have a slide on it. Um, you should know where it's divided. So it's divided from between the anterior, middle and posterior cranial fossa. Um, and the first division is at the lesser wing of the sphenoid, as we talked about before. And the second one is at the petrous part of the temporal bone here. Nice. These are the cranial foramina, um, kind of just rote learning, but some of it makes a little bit of sense. These are the important things. Um, so the bare minimum, you should try to learn all of these. Um, to go through them roughly, the cribriform plate over here um, has your first cranial nerve. Your optic canal over here has your second cranial nerve, as well as your ophthalmic artery, because they're both going to the eye, so that makes sense. Your superior orbital fissure has cranial nerves three, four, your first, fifth, cranial nerve and sixth um, and it's also got your superior ophthalmic veins um, you have your foramen rotundum with your maxillary nerve v2 foramen ovale with your mandibular nerve um, foramen spinosum which is this tiny little one with your middle meningeal artery um, you have your carotid canal here with your internal carotid artery so that makes sense you have your internal acoustic meatus over here um, and you can see that this is kind of the petrous part of your um, temporal bone so that makes sense because it has to go into your ear um, and that has your CN7 and 8 um, and like Alina said because it's in your ear you should have your vestibular cochlear nerve or CN8 and because facial nerve is in between 6 and 8 it's also in that one. Um, or if you want to remember it another way, your facial nerve is quite related to um, your middle ear. So that's also kind of close to the ear. Next thing is your jugular foramen. Um, so that's got most of your other cranial nerves, um, as well as your inferior petrosal and sigmoid sinus, which you'll learn in neuroanatomy, um, which runs into your um, IJV. And then um, your hypoglossal canal right next to um, the foramen magnum has your hypoglossal nerve. And then your foramen magnum essentially has everything else. Um, your medulla oblongata, so part of your brainstem, your meninges and your vertebral arteries, which um, run up your spine to supply your brain. That's your neurocranium. This is your viscerocranium. It's made up of 14 bones. And lots of them are quite little. The big ones would be um, mandible here, your jaw, your maxilla, and your zygomatic bones. Um, and then your small ones, you have like your lacrimal bones. You can remember like lacrimal like tears, kind of close to where your tear ducts are. Um, nasal, so by your nose. Your inferior nasal concha is a separate bone, um, whereas everything else is with your ethmoid. And then you have your palatine bones here in your vomia, which um, voma forms the midline. So this is your nasal bone. It's very small, um, kind of just an overage. This is the vomia, also kind of small. It's not even the last picture. Lacrimal bone um, here and here, just the inside of your eye. Zygomatic bone is big. Um, it's got your zygomaticofacial foramen for your zygomaticofacial nerves and vessels, but it's not very important to know. Um, this is your maxilla. 
and this has a bit. So your maxilla, you can see kind of forms the front here-ish of your, of your face, um, as well as your, the top part of your mouth. So your hard palate. Um, yep, so it forms the front of your palate. I think of this as things at the front and then things at the back. So at the front, you have your incisive canals. Um, and you might know that you, these sharp teeth are like called incisors. So you can think of that as to what's at the front. Um, and that's on either side of the incisive fossa. This is where the greater palatine vessels and the nasopalatine nerves travel between the oral and nasal cavities. So this essentially forms a connection between your mouth and your nose. And then at the back, um, you have the posterior nasal spine, not too important, um, but you do have the palatine canal, um, and that's from the pterygopalatine fossa. And that forms the greater and the lesser palatine foramen. The greater palatine foramen um, has greater palatine nerves and vessels to supply the hard palate, so that moves forward. Your lesser palatine foramen has your lesser palatine nerves and vessels to fly, supply the soft palate, and that that's posterior um, to your hard palate. And that makes sense because this is posterior as well. This is your mandible, so your jaw. Um, these are kind of the important parts. You have your condylar process um, and that's the back part. Um, so that forms part of your TMJ or your temporomandibular joint with your temporal bone. Um, and you also have your coronoid process and that's attachment of the temporalis muscle. Um, and this has to be in front of your condylar process because you can imagine that you want it to pull up to pull your jaw up and close your mouth. You have your mandibular foramen um, right over here, which forms your mandibular canal, as you can see moving inwards. And this is kind of like you're sitting in the inside of your mouth looking outwards. Um, and then that finishes out towards the front as your mental foramen. So your inferior alveolar nerve from B3 um, supplies your teeth as it travels through this and then turns into the mental nerve as it exits and supplies the chin. Um, your inferior alveolar vessels also travels through here. Your mylohyoid line forms your mylohyoid groove um, and that contains your lingual nerve and your nerve to the mylohyoid. Um, yeah, and so again, this is kind of with the dental block. You're aiming for the inferior alveolar nerve, but because it's in such close proximity to your lingual nerve, um, it kind of, yeah, sometimes you hit the wrong nerve. Um, cool. Other bits, not very important. Um, I'm not going to cover it because you can probably just read this in your own time. I wouldn't, I wouldn't really learn this. Yeah. This is your TMJ or your temporomandibular joint, pretty important, pretty high yield. Um, it's a synovial joint um, and it's, it's just over here. You can feel it when you move your jaw. It's formed by your head of the condylar process of your mandible and the tubercle of the tympanic part of your temporal bone. It's got a couple ligaments, um, your lateral sphenomandibular and your stylomandibular, not too important. Um, and the articular surfaces are covered with fibrocartilage and divided into two by an articular disc in between. Um, you should definitely know your muscles of mastication. So you have your masseter, which is this big one that's running from like your cheekbone all the way to the bottom of your jaw. You have your temporalis over here. So that's the one you feel when you chew on the side of your head. And you have your medial and lateral pterygoids which are right here. And these are deep kind of to the masseter. All of them developed from the first pharyngeal arch and all of them are innervated by the mandibular nerve or V3. Um, the way I remember what they do is that all of them elevate. Um, so all, all of them bring your jaw together, except the lateral pterygoid. And that's because they're um, oriented horizontally onto the pterygoid process. So that moves side to side like that, as well as protracts. So that way, backwards. Um, and your temporalis muscle also retracts the jaw a little bit because you can think that it sits kind of posterior as well. These are kind of some fossas that are useful to know because they come up, but they're not actually 
yeah, I wouldn't say they're particularly high yield to learn exactly everything that's in them. But you have your temporal fossa here. Um, main things here would be your temporalis muscle, um, middle temporal artery. That feeds into your infratemporal fossa, yeah. Um, and then that feeds into your pterygopalatine fossa, and that's under your zygomatic arch right here. Um, this is a huge point of communication um, between your nose, your eye, your middle cranial fossa, um, and it's got the main two important things, and there would be all three um, important things would be your maxillary nerve and artery and your pterygopalatine ganglion. Cool, those are all your bony bits. Now onto the soft bits. Um, for your scalp, definitely know the pneumonic scalp um, as you move from external to internal. So firstly, skin, um, then connective tissue. Then you have your apon aponeurosis, um, which is made up of your occipital frontalis muscle. Basically, it's just muscle. Um, yep, and then you've got your loose areolar tissue, which is just fat. Um, and then your pericranium or your periosteum, um, which just covers um, your bone. Um, the tone of your aponeurosis inhibits closure of blood vessels and skin um, in scalp lacerations, which means that deep scalp wounds will gape. Superficial scalp wounds, which don't go all the way through this muscle, won't, lacer um, won't gape, essentially. Um, Yep, and that's all you really have to know. Yep, SCA is just the first three layers. So I'm saying that um, they all kind of can move. So if you if you feel the top of your head and you can like move your skin around, um, that's these three moving. And then arteries are between the first and the second layer. Innovation, I wouldn't say you have to know a lot about, but you can see with this diagram that the facial bit is with your trigeminal nerve, like the rest of your face. And then the rest is from your cervical plexus. So C2, C3, and C4, like this. Um, and you've got anterior and posterior rami to all of these that we'll cover later. Um, arterial supply, you have your internal carotids at the front. So right here, this is kind of your, this is your nose, this is your ear, you're looking from up down. Um, and then all the rest are branches of your external carotid. These are your facial muscles. I wouldn't say you have to know all of them very well. I think we've had a question or two, um, so you can if you want. They develop from the second pharyngeal arch, so they're all innervated by your facial nerve, or CN7, um, and you have four groups. Um, the last group is on the next slide. So you have your orbital group that has your orbicularis oculi, which goes all the way around, and your corrugator supercilli, which bring your eyebrows, eyebrows together. You have your nasal group, so your procurus for your eyebrows moving downwards. You have your nasalis and your depressor septum nasi. Um, and then other, these are a little bit more like easy to remember. So your platysma is this huge one that makes you like, if you tense up your neck, you can kind of see it. Um, you have your auricular muscles, anterior, superior, and posterior. You have your occipital frontalis, so that's forming the aponeurosis or your third level of your scalp right there. These are your um, oral group of muscles, and there are a lot of them, so you don't really have to know all of them, but if you wanted to learn them the way I did was, I moved from 12 to six o'clock and they just kind of go around. Um, and then depending on where they are, you can kind of think about how they move your mouth. Um, yeah, I'm not gonna go through too many of them. Your buccinator sucks your cheek to your teeth. So that's pretty, pretty cool. And your mentalis over here will make you pout. Um, other than that, like levator obviously elevates and then your depressors tend to make you frown. They're all innervated by the facial nerve. Yes, we've kind of been through this. Um, and note the connected bits. So this is quite important. I think it's important to know what's connected to what. Um, and often exam questions would be like, oh, um, why is this happening? And and it will be because of some kind of connection. Um, and that might be like some kind of CSF leak or it can be an infection or anything else like that. So you have nasal sinuses um, over here and they all drain into your nasal cavity. Yeah. Your middle ear is connected to your nasopharynx via the eustachian tube. 
Um, you have your oral cavity and your nasal cavity, which are separated by your hard palate and your soft palate. Um, yeah, this is your pharynx and that turns into your esophagus. Um, your pharynx is split into your nasopharynx by your nose and your oropharynx by your mouth. And you also have the larynx here in the front, which turns into your trachea. So that moves us into the neck. Key relations, um, your neck goes into your thorax or your chest via the thoracic inlet and it goes to the upper limbs via the axillary inlet. Some, some key landmarks, um, at C3 and C4, you have your common carotid artery bifurcation into your external and internal carotid arteries to supply your head and neck. Um, at C5 and 6, that's where you transition between the larynx and trachea and the pharynx and esophagus. So that's larynx and trachea and pharynx and esophagus at C5 and 6. These are the bony bits of the neck. Um, so it's basically the cervical vertebrae. C1 is your atlas. So that classically um, has an anterior and posterior arch with no vertebral body. Um, that makes an atlantoaxial joint with your axis, um, which is C2, and that classically has the dens or the odontoid process. Um, and to view C1 and C2, you can ask for an AP open mouth projection X-ray, um, which is pretty cool. Otherwise, you have your typical vertebrae, um, and those have transverse processes on the side, um, down here, like there, um, which house your vertebral arteries and veins, except for C7, and that's actually a weirdly important point that they like to test you on. Um, your vertebral bo body is rectangular and your foramen is triangular and they have bifid spinous processes um, and that's because you have a knuckle ligament that's in between them. This is a Jefferson fracture um, and that's just a fracture through the anterior and posterior arches of your atlas and that happens because everything is connected so if you fracture one point you have to fracture another point as well and you're worried about a vertebral artery injury because it supplies your brain. Muscles of the neck, there are a lot. They're not necessarily all very important, particularly the posterior ones are not important at all. The anterior and lateral um, muscles are a little bit more important. So these are your anterior cervical muscles. Superficially, you have your platysma um, and your sternocleidomastoid, which has two um, heads um, because you have it from the sternum to the clavicle. Um, sternum to the, wait, no, yeah, sternum and the clavicle to the mastoid process behind your ear, um, and therefore it has two heads, and you also have the subclavius, which is a small muscle. You have your suprahyoids um, above your hyoid bone, which is right here, which includes your digastric muscle, di for two, so it has two heads or bellies, so it has anterior and posterior belly. You have your mylohyoid from your molar to your hyoid kind of, which forms like the base here underneath. You have your geniohyoid, which is on the other side of your mylohyoid running from your chin um, again to your hyoid bone. Genio kind of means chin. And then your stylohyoid from your styloid process um, to your hyoid bone, which is on the side here. And then you have your infrahyoid, so you're underneath your hyoid bone. And they're named from inferior to superior. So you have your sternohyoid from your sternum to your hyoid. And then you have your sternothyroid, which from from your sternum to your thyroid cartilage. And then you have your thyrohyoid, which runs from your thyroid cartilage to your hyoid bone. And you have your omohyoid, which I think I have a better picture um, here is this one here. Um, and the important thing about this muscle is that it wraps around the IJV and attaches to um, your scapula all the way around the, around the back. These are your lateral cervical muscles. Um, you have a couple like rectus things, but remember your scalenes, all of them originate from your transverse processes and then attach either onto the first rib or the second rib. The second rib is for the posterior scalene only. So the anterior and the middle scalene all attach to the first rib. Above the anterior scalene, you can find a couple things. Um, so you can find your phrenic nerve running over here. 
branches of your thyrocervical trunk, um, as well as your subclavian vein. Between your anterior and middle scalenes, you can find your brachial plexus and your subclavian artery. Um, and they like to test that. Cool, so another picture. These are your posterior cervical muscles. Don't know them. Ha. Um, this is high yield. So cervical cross-section and fascias. Um, you have one superficial cervical fascia all the way around the sides. And then you have um, fascias that enclose all these different spaces. So one way to kind of think about it is they're all called pre-something because if you were to try to get to these structures, you have to run through the fascia first. So pre-vertebral fascia is going to you, is going to block your access from the outside to your ver vertebra. So that's right the, here in the yellow. Your pre-tracheal has to contain your trachea because it's pre-tracheal. Um, so this one runs um, to your pericardium classically. It contains a lot of your kind of midline anterior structures like your pharynx, larynx, esophagus, trachea, your thyroid, your parathyroids, which are on your th thyroid, um, the recurrent laryngeal nerve right over here and your strap muscles. Um, and then you have your carotid sheath, which is quite important on the sides here. And this contains your common carotid artery, your IJV or internal jugular vein and your vagus nerve or CNX. Um, it's pierced by your glossopharyngeal nerve and your ansa cervicalis. Um, and it's collected by an ALAR fascia. I wonder if it's on this picture, I'm not sure, but it's connected. Um, and then you have an investing layer, um, which holds your traps and your um, sternocleidomastoid muscles. So that's on the outside. Um, so thinking about this, you can think about your goiter complications. Um, so because it's in this one here, your pre-tracheal -tra fascia, it can compress any of these things. So if it compresses your larynx, you get dysphonia. If it compresses your trachea, you get cough and dyspnea or shortness of breath. If it compresses your esophagus, you get dysphagia or difficulty swallowing. Um, and if it compresses your SVC, superior vena cava, then you can get superior vena cava syndrome um, or Pemberton's. So that's when you hold your arm up and it's, um, it turns your face red. Um, this is not that important, but essentially um, you can get a cervical connective tissue injury if you are in a car crash or something. And that's characteristic of this kind of whiplash injury where your head's thrown backwards and forwards. Um, yeah. Cool. This is your cervical plexus. Um, so this supplies um, a couple of things in your neck essentially, and it's in the posterior triangle of your neck, which I'll cover in the next few slides. Um, you've got cutaneous branches, which supply your skin, as we saw before. Um, so you've got anterior rami that curls around your sternocleidomastoid muscle, um, and that includes your lesser occipital and your kind of occipital region. You've got your greater auricular by your ear, your transverse cervical by your neck, and your supraclavicular just above your clavicle. Um, yep. And then you've got your posterior rami. So you've got your greater occipital for the rest of your kind of occipital region. And then you have the dorsal rami of C3, 4, and 5 for the rest of the back of your neck. And then you've got a couple of muscular branches. So C1 travels with your hypoglossal nerve to supply your suprahyoids or the muscles above your hyoid bone. Um, your ansa cervicalis is probably one of the biggest branches you need to know from this. Um, that's C1 to 3, and that supplies your straps. So your sternohyoid and sternothyroid, as well as your omohyoid. And then you've got your phrenic nerve, C345, keeps the diaphragm alive. So that supplies your diaphragm and pericardium. Um, and then you've got some other branches like for your scalenes and other cervical muscles. These are your triangles of the neck. So you have your anterior and your posterior triangles. Um, and your anterior triangle um, is bordered by your mandible, your sternocleidomastoid and the midline. It's associated with structures between your head and your thorax. Your posterior triangle 
um, has the borders of your clavicle, your sternocleidomastoid, and your trapezius muscle. And that's associated with your axillary inlet. So this is your anterior triangle. Um, don't worry too much about it. You can probably work out what's in it. Basically just midline structures like your hyoid bone, your larynx, your thyroid, um, as well as your carotid sheath. Um, your spinal accessory nerve and like your glossopharyngeal and hypoglossal nerves are also in here. And then this is your posterior triangle. Again, looks quite messy, um, but just know that your um, cervical plexus is here, um, as well as your accessory nerve, um, which here is right here. And that classically innervates your sternocleidomastoid and your trapezius, and it's very superficial. Um, so clinically, if you basically hit someone in their posterior um, triangle, you're worried about a accessory nerve palsy. Um, so you would test um, kind of whether they can shrug their shoulders or turn their head sideways. Cool, that's done. Um, now onto vasculature of the head and neck. Um, basically the arterial supply is just your carotid arteries, um, comes off um, your right brachiocephalic trunk, as well as your aortic arch, so as your common carotids. And then it bifurcates at C4 um, by kind of your thyroid cartilage into your external and internal carotid arteries. Your external carotid arteries supply your head and neck. Your internal carotid arteries supply your brain um, and CNS with the vertebral arteries coming up the back of the spine. Um, and that comes your, from your thyrocervical trunk here. Um, that's with the exception of one branch, which is the ophthalmic artery, which um, goes through um, into your eye. These are your branches of your external carotid artery. There's a little mnemonic for it. Some intendings like freaking out potential medical students. So um, superior thyroid, ascending pharyngeal, lingual, facial, which um, supplies most of your face, um, maxillary, which I would say is the biggest branch and basically the only branch that you have to know, kind of. Um, and that's because it, it's big. It travels through your infratemporal fossa into your pterygopalatine fossa, and it becomes the middle meningeal artery. So that's the one associated with your blow to the pterium. Um, and it also supplies your TMJ. So that's your big one, the maxillary artery. Remember that one. Um, moving on, posterior auricular, um, occipital by occiput, and your superficial temporal. So you can kind of guess what each one does um, already from their name. I wouldn't say you particularly have to learn them off by heart. This is your internal carotid artery. So CNS, you'll do this in neuro, um, but it forms your ophthalmic artery over here by your optic canal. You can see that it's kind of traveling with the optic nerve here. Um, and then it forms a couple of branches that you don't really have to know. Venous drainage of the head and neck. Um, again, you don't have to know all the details. Know that it all eventually drains into your subclavian um, and you've got your external and internal jugular veins. So external jugular vein is this one. It's actually a little smaller, I think. Um, and that receives things from the retromandibular vein um, and your posterior auricular vein um, and drains things kind of posteriorly like in this region. Your internal jugular vein as you can see is kind of the big fat one between uh, behind it um, and that drains things anteriorly so most of your face um, coming from like things like the facial vein. Um, the very important thing about this is that um, is two things actually. One is the risk for cavernous sinus thrombosis. And that's because um, the facial vein communicates with the superior ophthalmic vein um, here, 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 and here, um, which leads to the cavernous sinus in the back. Um, and you'll do a bit more of that in neuro, I think. Um, so you're worried about cavernous sinus thrombosis there. And you're also worried because facial and cranial veins are valveless. And so infection travels really easily. And so if you get infection in your facial veins, um, then it can very easily spread to your brain. 
These are your lymphatics. Um, so half of the lymph nodes in your body lie in the head and neck. Um, the closer it is to the midline, the more likely it will drain either way, which is quite um, intuitive. If you have an exam question saying that you can feel a lymph node which is enlarged and hard, you're thinking cancer. If, you're, if it's enlarged and tender or painful, you're thinking infection. Um, so your submental node drains most of your chin, your submandibular drains like kind of middle of your face, and your preauricular is kind of like your eyes, your nose, your lateral cheek. So it's pretty intuitive that way. And then they all end up going down into the deep cervical group. Two big nodes that you should know should be the Birchow's node. So that's your supraclavicular node here. Um, and that drains your intra-abdominal or thoracic organs. A classic exam question would be, this is enlarged, what cancer is it? And it's gastric cancer usually. Otherwise your jugular digastric lymph node or your upper cervical lymph node, otherwise known as your tonsil, um, might be enlarged in a sore throat. Temporal arteritis, um, I don't think you have to know too much about, but it's an inflammation of your temporal artery, um, your superficial temporal artery um, in particular. Um, and a classic presentation would be an old woman um, with kind of pain and stiffness um, who developed like a really bad headache, especially when she's combing her hair. Um, and she also gets some jaw pain or claudication um, with ch chewing. Um, she might also have visual signs. Um, yeah, so like some vision loss or double vision like that. Um, and the treatment is high dose corticosteroids to reduce the inflammation in that artery. Innovation. Um, so lots of this has been covered by Alina, probably all of it already. So it's largely supplied by your cranial nerves. Glands have autonomic innovations. So like PNS makes it um, secrete and those roots come from cranial nerves. Um, your SNS roots come from your thoracic region. They feed into the sympathetic train, travel to the top, um, exit via T1 superior cervical ganglion and travel via like your blood vessels um, to reach their destination. Um, and then you also have your cervical plexus C1 to 5, which is supplying some cutaneous and muscular innervation to the neck. This is a cranial nerve summary again. Again, which we've covered before. Cool, done. Nice, upper respiratory tract and pharynx. This is kind of the second half of this talk. Again, reminding us of our connected bits, which is what we're gonna cover now. Mm -hmm. Starting with the air. So relations with the air, it's connected to the nasal cavity via the pharyngeotopanic tube or your eustachian tube. It's connected to the outside world via your external acoustic meatus. And it's cr connected to your cranial cavity, well, separated by your temporal bone. So your ear is split into your outer ear, your middle ear, and your inner ear. Um, and the bony part is all part of your temporal bone. Um, a brief overview of function, okay. Um, so basically sound travels through your ear or through the ear into your ear, um, kind of vibrates your eardrum, um, which is attached to your ossicles. So your malleus, your incus and your stapes, um, that's all in your middle ear. That functions to amplify the sound. You can see that your, your eustachian tube is right here um, and that travels to your nose, as I mentioned, and that equalizes the pressure because you can Im imagine there's pressure coming from the outside here. So you need some way to equalize that um, and you do that via your nose. And then your st stapes um, is attached to your inner ear. Um, and so that kind of vibrates or moves some liquid um, in your inner ear which is detected by your um, vestibular cochlear nerve um, and that sends a signal to your brain. Your semicircular canals right here also have some fluid which functions in balance um, and that's what makes you dizzy. We'll go through all of this in a bit more detail later. So this is your external ear. It consists of your oracle, which is the outside bit which you can feel and your external acoustic meatus, which is the canal. Um, skin cancers often present here at the helix and a Darwin's tubercle here is normal apparently. Um, with your oracle, 
you can kind of remember what things are. So you have your helix um, up the top and then your anti-helix, which is on the inside. Um, you have the lobule or your lobe. You have your tragus and then your anti-tragus. And then between that, your inter-tragus, tragic notch. Your external cuticle meatus is right here. That's your crew of the helix. Um, and other than that, I don't think you have to know too much. Um, this is your tympanic membrane, which we should have later. Yeah. So your external air or oh yeah, your external acoustic meatus is made of cartilage for the lateral, like one third of the wall. And then the other two thirds on the inside is formed by your temporal bone here. It's not straight, so during an examination, you should pull the air upward, posteriorly, and outward. Um, ceramone is wax, and then associated muscles are innervated by your facial nerve. Um, you don't have to know all of this innovation in detail. I put it down because, you know, we like to have all the information there. But um, one important one to know is you have a branch of the vagus nerve there. So your CNX, um, which can cause fainting during air washing. And that's been in an exam question before, not in too much detail, but like what cranial nerve is it? CNX. Um, yeah, don't have to know too much about the arterial supply or venous drainage, but most of them have the auricular in them, which really helps. Um, same thing with the lymphatic drainage. So you've traveled through the external canal. Now you've gone into your, well, we've met our tympanic membrane. Um, and it's quite important to actually know the parts. So you have your pars facida and your pars tensa, which is makes up the bulk of your um, tympanic membrane. You have your cone of light, which you look for, because if you lose it, then um, you're thinking there might be some kind of effusion or fluid buildup from your middle ear. Um, this is the umbo um, and handle of your malleus, which is your um, first little ossicle. Um, yeah, other than that, nothing too much else. It's innervated by the auricular temporal nerve, which is a branch of the vandibular nerve, and it's also got an irregular branch of the vagus nerve as well. Cool. Middle ear. Um, so we've gone through the tympanic membrane now into the middle ear. It's within the temporal bone still, um, and it consists of the tympanic cavity, kind of by um, the eardrum, and your epitympanic recess, so right above that. Um, and it communicates with two places, um, like I mentioned before, your mastoid area and your pharyngotympanic or eustachian tube. So your mastoid area is posterior and you're worried about um, infection spreading between the middle ear and these mastoid air cells. Um, your pharyngotympanic tube runs to your nasopharynx um, and that's why you can make your ears pop by blocking, blocking your nose and blowing out. Um, and it's surrounded by cartilage and the tensor villi palatini muscle, TVP, and that contracts when you swallow, which can open up the tube. So next time you're like in an airplane or something, you feel your ears blocking up, swallow, um, it'll tense up your TVP um, and equalize the pressure in your middle ear. Neurovasculature, don't have to know too much about this. Um, innovation of the mucous membranes is by the tympanic complexes formed by the tympanic nerve which is a branch of the glossopharyngeal. Um, yeah, I wouldn't say too important. Cool, middle ear contents. You have your ossicles. Um, so malleus, incus, and stapes. You can see that your malleus is like kind of a, a weird um, shape right here. It's got a handle, which is attached to the tympanic membrane and the tensor tympani muscle. It's got a lateral process as well as an anterior process. Um, and then it's got the head, which actually articulates with the incus, um, particularly um, the body of the incus. And then the incus has a long limb with a lenticular process, which articulates with the head of the stapes um, right over here. And then that's got two limbs with an oval base, which articulates the oval window on the labyrinth wall in your inner ear. Um, and that's associated with your stapedius muscle. You have two muscles in your middle ear, your tensor tympani and your stapedius. Your tensor tympani muscle is actually kind of big. You can see it runs here and 
yeah, it attaches to the handle of the malleus, um, which is kind of towards us in this picture. Um, and that tenses the tympanic membrane. Your stapedius is um, over here. It's a lot smaller. It's from the mastoid wall. It, 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 attaches to the neck of the stapes and it pulls the stapes posteriorly to pre prevent excessive oscillation in response to loud noises. Um, yeah. This is the structures in the middle ear. I'm sure you know, you, this is kind of high yield. They're always like, learn this. Um, there's not really like an easy way to learn this in my opinion, you kind of just do it. Um, but we can go through it or we can, or you can just learn it. I think I think the best thing is just just draw it um, a couple of times, um, and think about it, and refer to this picture as well. I think this puts it in a lot of um, perspective. Yeah. All right. This is everything. Um, this is in word form essentially. If you like to um, memorize things that way, I think we won't go through this. I think it's just reading out. Nice. Otitis media is an infection of the middle ear. Um, it's very common, usually due to RSV. Um, and yeah, that's kind of all you have to know. You can kind of see over here um, with your otoscope picture that it's all bulging and that's because you've got fluid in your middle ear, um, which you can see from the outside. This is mastoiditis. So you're worried that it's a complication usually of otitis media. Um, it's spread because it's right posterior to your middle ear um, and it's caused this kind of swelling behind the ear. Um, and this is this is important and this is very scary. So yeah, that's basically all you have to know about it. This is the internal ear. So the last part or the innermost part of the ear, it's in the petrous part of your temporal bone. Um, remember splitting our middle and um, posterior cranial fossas. It's got um, structures for hearing and balance, and the nerve response for both, both of these is your vestibulocochlear nerve. Your internal ear consists of your bony labyrinth, um, which contains your membranous, bony, membranous labyrinth inside. Um, so your bony labyrinth is lined with periosteum and it contains perilim, um, which is a type of fluid. It's made up of the vestibule, your cochlea and three semicircular canals oriented 90 degrees to each other. Your membranous labyrinth um, contains endolymph um, and it's got your vestibular system, um, which is your three semicircular ducts, your utricle and your saccule, um, as well as your cochlea duct. Yeah. So this is your cochlea. This is for hearing. Um, yeah, it's kind of shaped like soft serve. Um, so you're all like a snail. Um, and so it's got this internal tubing spiraling towards the center. Um, and this is kind of cut through like that way. So it looks like that from here to here. Um, the bony labyrinth is made up of the modiolus, um, which contains passages for the cochlear nerve. Um, and throughout its length is a spiral lamina or the lamina of the modiolus um, um, to which the membranous labyrinth is attached. The membranous labyrinth contains endolymph. Um, it splits the tube into three segments by the vestibular membrane and the basilar membrane. The central canal is the cochlear duct and that contains endolymph. And that runs from your oval window, which your um, stapes is um, attached to, um, to the apex. And the spiral organ of corti, which is this guy here, is on the basilar membrane and that detects movement of that fluid inside, um, which has been transmitted by the stapes um, to transmit signals, as you can see here, to the cochlear nerve. The other two ducts are continuous at the helicocatrema, which is right at the top here, and they contain perilymph. The scalar vestibuli conducts vibrations to the cochlear duct um, and the scalar tympani, which is the bottom, runs from the calico tumor to the round window of the middle ear. And I think that's more to balance out the pressure. Um, you also have the cochlear canaliculus, um, which isn't very important. This is the vestibular system. Um, so this is for balance. It consists of three semicircular canals, anterior, posterior, and lateral, 
positioned at 90 degrees to each other. The ampulla, which is, well, it's a bit hard to see, but it's these bits here, the round bits of the semicircular ducts detects rotational acceleration. Um, these three empty into the utricle, which is over here, and that detects vertical acceleration. Cochlear duct empties into the saccule, um, and the macula of the saccule detects horizontal acceleration. So knowing which is rotational, which is vertical, and which is horizontal is quite important. Um, labyrinthitis is inflammation of the semicircular canals, um, and patients become very disoriented, but it's quite short-lived. These are the vessels and nerves associated with the internal ear, mainly your vestibular cochlear nerve. Um, and it's got your cochlea and your vestibular branches. Um, you've also got your facial nerve, which is associated with the middle ear. And then blood supply, not very important, um, but essentially your bony labyrinth is kind of the same as your surrounding temporal bone, so external carotid artery, um, and your membranous labyrinth flows with your brain circulation. So that's, um, yeah, cool. Nasal cavity. So relations, um, it, you travel into your nasopharynx via coanae, uh, which we'll talk about straight after this. Um, your cranial cavity up here is separated by your ethmoid bone, your oral cavity by your maxilla. Um, it's specifically by your incisive canal, as we talked about before at the front. Um, your middle ear by your pharyngeal tympanic tube, your nasal sinuses, and the external world via your nares or your nose holes. This is your nasal skeleton. So you've got an external nasal skeleton, which is made up of a couple of bones, your nasal bone forming the bridge, your maxilla forming the sides. Um, and then you kind of have like cartilages. So you have your septal, your lateral, your alar, um, and then you have just some fibro fatty tissue over here. Your koane is the boundary between your nasal cavity and your nasal pharynx by the back. That's formed by three bones, your vomer um, down the middle, your sphenoid making up most of it, and your palatine by your palate, so down the bottom. This is your internal nasal septum. It's made up of a lot of bones. Um, you can learn it. Um, but the important things, I guess your frontal, you can see here, your nasal making up your front, um, your ethmoid with your cribriform plate where the olfactory nerve fibers go in. This is your sphenoid with your sphenoid sinus. Um, yep, the pterygoid processes, your vomer, which you can only basically see by the inside of your nose, um, your maxilla making up your hard palate, um, and then your palatine bone making up the rest of your hard palate. This is your lateral wall. Um, so again, made up of a lot of bones. Um, your central bones are your lacrimal bone, your um, inferior nasal concha, as you can see here, which is a separate bone. The other concha are made up of your ethmoid bone. Um, and they're all concha, con con yeah, concha. Um, it's superior, middle and inferior. And then under these, Contrary. Oh, I don't know how to pronounce it. You have your superior, middle, and inferior meatus. So things that enter and exit the nose. Um, I think I had better slides. Yep. We'll go through the nerves and then we'll go through the arteries. So you have a couple of foramen. You have your sphenopalatine foramen, which communicates with your pterygopalatine fossa. Um, so a lot of the posterior nose stuff comes from here. Then you have your incisive canal here, which has a lot of anterior nose stuff. You have your foramen cecum and your cribriform plate and your ethmoid bone. And then you have things coming from um, your nares um, and then other small foramina. So your sphenopalatine foramen in terms of nerves gives you your um, maxillary branch nerves. So you have your posterior lateral nasal nerves or your posterior bit, and then you have your nasopalatine nerve. And you can hear you can hear in the name that it's nasopalatine, so it goes from your nose all the way anterior to your palate through your incisive canal um, and enters your oral cavity. Then your foramen cecum 
doesn't have any nerves. Your cribriform plate has your olfactory nerve fibers, as well as your anterior ethmoidal nerve, which is an ophthalmic V1 branch, not that important. Around your nares, you can get internal nasal branches of an infraorbital nerve coming from under your eye. Um, and your small foramina has other inferior nasal branches from the greater palatine branch of V2. Um, and then in terms of arteries, um, your sphenopalatine foramen has your sphenopalatine artery, and that's a big artery um, that you should hopefully remember from your maxillary artery. Um, your incisive canal has your greater palatine arteries, which have traveled from um, your greater palatine foramen in the back all the way across your palate, supplying the palate through your incisive, oops, incisive canal into your nose. Um, Yep, your foramen cecum has your nasal vein going into your superior sagittal sinus. Um, your cribriform plate doesn't really, yeah, it has a couple of arteries, um, anterior, posterior, ethmoidal ones. And then around your nares, you have your alar branches from your um, nasal artery, which comes from your facial artery, um, which runs across your face like that. Cool. More pictures. This is high yield. So Kisselbeck's area or little area is um, where nosebleeds happen. Um, and that's because it's a site of anastomoses between your internal and external carotid arteries. So your internal carotid arteries, um, you have your anterior and posterior ethmoidal arteries, which come from your ophthalmic artery, um, which is basically the only branch of the internal carotid that supplies your head and neck. Um, your external carotid um, branches also run through the maxillary artery, and then those are your greater palatine artery and sphenopalatine artery. So to remind you, your sphenopalatine is coming from your sphenopalatine foramen, and your greater palatine artery is coming from your incisive canal all the way from your palate. Uh, venous and lymphatic drainage. Yeah, anteriorly you can go to the facial vein, posteriorly to the pterygoid plexus, superiorly, oops, by the ethmoidal veins. Um, not that important. Cool. Yeah, these are your nasal sinuses. So you have um, kind of four types. You have your frontal sinuses um, on your frontal bone. Um, and they drain into, I wonder if I have a better picture. Yes, I have a better picture. Um, and then you have your ethmoidal. So those are like lots of little ones. You have your anterior, middle and posterior, they all kind of sit right here. Um, you have your sphenoidal. So that's this one over here at the back of your nose. Um, and you can see that your pituitary gland is sitting in the cell tesco there. And then your maxillary, which is the big ones kind of by your cheekbone. And they all open up into your nasal cavity. Um, so I think an easier way to learn how they drain is actually via the holes that they can drain into rather than what each one drains into. Um, so your sphenoethmoidal recess um, over here is where your sphenoid sinus can drain because it's right there. And that's kind of like above um, your first concha. And then you have your superior meatus um, for your posterior ethmoidal um, cells. And then you have your middle meatus, um, which is like the big one. So the middle meatus, the, you can see the superior is like very small, um, but the middle one is the big one. And that's got a semilunar hiatus over here. Um, and that is where the frontal sinus over here drains, as well as your anterior ethmoidal cells. Um, and your maxillary sinus also drains underneath um, in that middle meatus. You also have this um, ethmoid bulla, um, which has openings, and that's where your middle ethmoidal cells drain. So you, you can see with your ethmoidal um, sinuses, it kind of goes anterior in the semilunar to your ethmoid bulla in the middle ethmoidal um, to your superior meatus for your posterior. And then inferior meatus, you have drainage of your nasolacrimal duct as well as your pharyngotympanic tube, which is kind of cheating. I guess that's kind of behind um, over there. All right, that's your nose done. 
Um, now on to the oral cavity. So um, relations, so oropharynx down the back via the oropharyngeal isthmus, the nasal cavity via the maxilla and externally via the oral fissure. Um, it's got a lot of things. How am I going to explain this? Um, so you, on the roof, you have a hard and soft palate, hard at the front, soft at the back. You can see on this picture, you have the tongue, you have your um, uvula here, you have your palatopharyngeal arch, um, which forms your oropharyngeal isthmus. And that's quite important because you also have your palato, um, oh no, you have your palatoglossal arch, which forms your oropharyngeal isthmus. And then you also have your palatopharyngeal arches. Um, and in between those two arches, you have your palatine tonsil. Um, you have a couple of salivary glands, which I'll cover later. You have your lips, your philtrum, your frenulum, which is this bit um, here. And then these are the muscles. So like I mentioned before, your mylohyoid, kind of from your molars. Um, and then your genio hyoid, hyoid closer to your tongue above that because, yeah, chin for genio. Um, I think the important relation here is that the lingual nerve over here runs underneath that submandibular duct, um, which is where your saliva comes out of your submandibular salivary gland. Cool, your hardened palate, as I mentioned, we kind of covered in the maxilla. Mm -hmm. And then the soft palate is in this line. So all the soft palate muscles are innervated by the vagus nerve or CNX, except for tensor veli palatini, which is um, innervated by your mandibular nerve. Um, you have a couple of muscles. So your palatoglossus, um, or which is here, is anterior to your palatopharyngeus which is here. And that's because your tongue's in front of your pharynx, makes sense. Um, and these form palatoglossal and the palatopharyngeal arches with the pal palatine tonsil in between them. They act to depress the soft palate, which is here. And you can see that because they're underneath, makes sense. Um, and remember this forms your oropharyngeal isthmus, which makes sense as well, because this is basically in your pharyng um, pharynx already. Um, and then your tensor veli palatini is anterior to your levator veli palatini. Both elevate the soft palate. Um, this is your levator, this is your tensor, um, except only the levator lifts it above neutral. And you can see that because the tensor veli palatini actually comes around, wraps around your pterygoid pamulus and then comes back around. Um, and this is kind of looking from back to front. Um, whereas this one kind of just attach, attaches directly, so it can pull all the way up. Um, TVP opens the, tim, uh, the pharyngeal tympanic tube during yawning and swallowing. Um, and then you have um, your musculus uvulae, which pulls your uvula um, superiorly. Neurovasculature, as I mentioned, from your greater palatine foramen to your incisive fossa, from your incisive canals. Um, for your hard palate and then for your soft palate, you're thinking your lesser um, palatine nerves and arteries. Um, innovation, kind of same. Yeah. Teeth and gingiva are, slow, are you low yield, I think. The biggest thing to remember would probably that you have teeth which are attached to alveoli or the sockets and the gingiva or the gums. Innovation is by the superior and the inferior alveolar nerves and the buccal nerve a little bit. So your tongue. Um, this is the general structure of your tongue. Um, the terminal sulcus is this bit here, which separates the anterior two thirds and the posterior one third. The apex of that V is the foramen cecum, and that's where your thyroid gland develops. It's divided left to right by your median sagittal septum. Um, and you've got these papillae or these little bumps, which increase the oral surface um, area. Um, you've got a lingual tonsil, um, which, yeah, which sits on the pharyngeal surface. Um, and the inferior surface from medial lateral has your frenulum 
then your lingual vein, then your fibrinated fold. These are your tongue muscles. They're all supplied by your hypoglossal nerve. Um, so you've seen 12, except your palatoglossus, which is um, innervated by your vagus nerve because it's kind of considered part of the palate muscles. And that's the only one that has palate in it. Makes sense. Um, you have intrinsic muscles and extrinsic muscles. So intrinsic muscles alter the shape of your tongue. Um, so that's what makes you curl your tongue, shorten your tongue, flatten your tongue. You have superior and inferior longitudinal muscles. And you also have transverse and vertical. So they kind of just run in all directions. Um, and then for your extrinsic muscles, again, they kind of are all anatomical. So your genia glosses from your genie or your chin to your tongue, your hyoglosses from your hyoid bone, your styloglosses from the styloid bone, from your temporal bone, um, and then your palatoglosses, um, which is from your palate at the top. This is an important relation. So from inner to outer, you have your genioglossus muscle um, and then your lingual artery here, which is all the way behind. Then you have your hyoglossus muscle. Then you have your hypoglossal um, or lingual nerve. There. These are your vessels. So they're all branches of the lingual artery, um, which comes from your external carotid. You have your dorsal venous uh, or dorsal lingual artery and vein at the back, and then that splits into your deep lingual and then your sublingual. That's basically all you have to know. And then innovation is high yield. So the muscles of your tongue are all supplied by your hypoglossal nerve or CN12. Your palatoglossus um, is supplied by your vagus nerve because it's part of the palate. For sensation, the anterior two thirds is supplied by your trigeminal nerve for general sensation, and then your facial nerve via the quarter tympani for special sensation. And remember, it gives off the quarter tympani kind of by the middle ear. The posterior one third is supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve for both, and then your epiglottis and hard palate is supplied by vagus nerve. If you have a issue with the vagus nerve, your uvula will deviate towards the normal side. Whereas with you, if you have an issue with the hypoglossal nerve, your tongue will deviate towards the abnormal side. Um, yeah, you can read that as the same information. These are your salivary glands. You have kind of three pairs of the big ones. Um, you have your parotid, your submandibular, and your sublingual. So your sub, or your parotid gland is your big one right over here. It's pierced by a lot of things, um, but from superficial to deep, and it's good to remember this um, order, uh, you have your facial nerve over here with your five terminal branches. You have your retromandibular vein. You have your external carotid artery and you have lymph nodes. The duct opens to your second upper molar. That's the green thing here. Um, in terms of innovation, note that the glossopharyngeal nerve is the one that um, makes it um, salivate. And then your submandibular gland um, curls around your mylohyoid. I wonder if I have a better picture. Mm. Mm, yeah, submandibular gland around that muscle there. Um, and it's got a couple of relations. So the facial artery loops above the superficial lobe. Mm, wonder if I have a picture. Yeah. So your facial artery kind of goes from your neck to your face, um, and then it goes under that nerve there, and that's your mandible. Your lingual nerve lo loops under the duct, um, as we mentioned before. Um, and it opens to the sublingual caruncle, which is beside your frenulum under your tongue. Your sublingual gland has numerous like little openings um, and both of these are supplied by the corded tympani of the facial nerve. Um, because of that, parotidectomy can cause injury to the facial nerve. 
um, and you might get weakness or palsy of the facial muscles. Um, yeah, kind of same thing. Mumps is when you get a viral infection of the salivary glands, usually parotid gland, big swollen cheek. Um, yeah, and then you might also get kind of the same issues with your facial nerve. Cool. Now we're up to your pharynx. We're nearing the end, I think. Um, you have your pharynx is split into a couple of sections. You have your oropharynx, your nasopharynx, your laryngopharynx, by your larynx, um, and then your it turns into your esophagus at C five and six. Um, some of the bits that separate the bits, you have your coane at the back of your nose. You have the oropharyngeal isthmus. Um, at the back of your mouth. You have the pharyngeal isthmus between your oropharynx and your nasopharynx. Um, and then you have structures that can isolate or close off certain areas. So if this is your soft palate, if you elevate it, you can close the pharyngeal isthmus between your oropharyngeal, uh, or oropharynx and your nasopharynx. If, you, if it depresses or if the tongue elevates, you can close off this oropharyngeal isthmus and isolate your mouth. Um, and then the epiglottis can move forwards to isolate the larynx at the front. This is a general structure again and again. Um, yep, the pharynx is made up of soft tissue, so it needs to be attached to some places. Superiorly, it's attached to the pterygomandibular raph, and then posteriorly, the pharyngeal raph joins the pharyngeal muscles from each side and it runs from the esophagus to the pharyngeal tubercle. Um, anteriorly it's related to um, the hyoid bone and then inferiorly it's related to like the thyroid and cricoid cartilage so you can kind of see them in these red places here. These are your tonsils. So they're collections of lymphoid tissue that drain into your deep cervical nodes. They form the Waldeyer's ring um, that's made up of your adenoids, your tubal tonsils, your palatine tonsils, and your lingual tonsils. These are your pharyngeal muscles. You've got two groups, constrictors and longitudinal, uh, longitudinal muscles. Um, and each side are joined by the pharyngeal ref in the middle. Um, they're all innervated by the pharyngeal branch of the vagus nerve, except the stylopharyngeus, which is by the glossopharyngeal nerve. So these are your constrictor muscles. Um, think of them like a telescope with the inferior muscle most inside. Um, they form two sphincters. Um, and then you have a couple of things that run between them. So your oropharyngeal triangle between your superior and middle constrictors um, have your glossopharyngeal, your stylopharyngeus, and your lingual nerves running through it. Between your middle and inferior, you have, which it runs into the larynx, and you've got your internal laryngeal nerve and your laryngeal artery and vein. And under your inferior constrictor, you have your recurrent laryngeal nerve and vein. These are your longitudinal muscles, so they're the ones that run straight down. You have your stylopharyngeus from your styloid process. Where is your stylo process? It's hidden. And then your salpingopharyngeus from the pharyn pharyngeo pharyngotympanic tube um, over here, all the way down. You have your palatopharyngeus from your soft palate, like that. Um, and that forms the palatopharyngeal arch, like we mentioned before. Um, that's basically all you have to know. These are your pharyngeal spaces. I think the main thing to know from this is the danger space, which is posterior to the retropharyngeal space. I think the better picture. Yeah. Um, and that's a potential path of infection from the pharynx to the superior and posterior mediastinum. Media, mediastinum. Um, this is vasculature. So you have a pharyngeal venous plexus, and they drain superiorly into the pterygoid plexus. Um, into the IJV or inferiorly straight into the IJV. Um, and then arteries, you have just branches of your external carotid again. Innervation, um, largely by the pharyngeal plexus, uh, which is located over the middle constrictor in the retropharyngeal space. Um, yep, 
All motor from the pharynx is via the vagus nerve, except for the stylopharyngeus via the branch of the glossopharyngeal. Um, and all sensory is via the glossopharyngeal, except a couple of things. And therefore, this is like the big thing, gag reflex is nine in, 10 out. So sensation via nine, and then um, gagging is via 10. This is a pharyngeal fistula or a cyst. It's a congenital abnormality, and that's when the pharyngeal cleft doesn't completely degenerate. Um, yeah, so classically, the um, patient will present with finding chewed but undigested food on the pillow or halitosis, which is like the food rotting in their throat. This is your larynx. So this is the front bit. Um, you enter it via the laryngeal inlet, gated by the epiglottis, this guy here, and it turns into the trachea at C5-6. So larynx lets you laugh, so it lets you sing. Um, its functions are respiration, phonation, effort closure, and swallowing, um, and it's made up of cartilages. So you have unpaired cartilage, cartilage your epiglottis, which is this big one, your thyroid, and your cricoid. And then you have paired cartilage. So your arytenoids, your corniculates, straight above them. And then within the membrane, you have like a cuneiform, like a tiny little cartilage floating in the middle of nowhere. Um, not important. Yep, this is another view. Your epiglottis. Um, yep, you have your cricoid and your thyroid. Um, I think the details of these are not that important, so I'm not going to cover this. Huh. Ligaments, a bit more important. So um, your big one would be, oh, they're not actually drawn very well on this one, but on this picture, you can see that you have your thyrohyoid membrane. And then under that, you have your cricothyroid card, um, ligament. So these are your two big ones, kind of, um, and it's all in the name. Um, and then over your cricothyroid ligament, again shown in this picture, actually forms your true vocal cord um, or your vocal ligament over here. Um, and it also forms essentially the rima glotti or it borders the rima glottidis or glottidis, um, which is um, your, the space between your vocal cord, basically. The quadrangular membrane is a huge membrane that runs like from your epiglottis to your thyroid cartilage and your arytenoids. And that forms your vestibular ligament here. Um, and, and the space between those is called your rima vestibuli. Um, yep. And then like the mucosa kind of have these folds and they form like laryngeal ventricles and things like that um, that aren't as important. Cool. Laryngeal muscles are all innervated by your vagus nerve or CNX. Um, yeah, and they're all via the recurrent laryngeal branch apart from your cricothyroid, which is on the outside, and therefore it's supplied by your external branch um, of the superior laryngeal nerve. You have a lot of them. So you have your cricothyroid muscles running from your, um, here. You have your vocalis, which runs parallel with your, oh, I wonder a better picture, yeah. Um, you have your vocalis and your thyroarytenoids, which kind of run with your vocal cords. And because they run with your vocal cords, they contract to relax your vocal cords. You have your lateral cricoarytenoids from your cricoid to your arytenoids, um, your transverse over here near the back and your obliques, which kind of, this is a better picture, but your transverse and then your obliques run crisscross. Um, and these all adduct the arytenoids to close the rima glottidis, so to close your voice, um, your vocal cord. You have your posterior cricoarytenoids, which abducts the arytenoids. Um, and then your cricothyroid, because it's on the outside, it actually pulls your thyroid cartilage forwards and that tenses the vocal cords. Neurovasculature. Um, so this is this is pretty high yield, I reckon, um, but actually pretty okay to remember. 
in terms of arteries, you have your superior laryngeal coming from your top and you have your inferior laryngeal coming from the bottom. Your superior laryngeal comes from your external carotid because it goes all the way up. Your inferior comes from your thyrocervical trunk, um, which is not from your um, external carotid. Your veins kind of mimic that. Superior inferior laryngeal, perfectly named. Your lymph nodes, again, superior deep cervical and inferior deep cervical, perfectly named. And then your nerves, superiorly. So remember your vagus nerve is a cranial nerve. So it's coming from up rather than down like your blood vessels. You have your vagus nerve coming down and you have a superior laryngeal nerve. And this superior laryngeal nerve branches off into an internal and external branch. The external branch supplies your cricothyroid and as well as the inferior constrictor of your pharynx. And then the internal branch goes inside to um, provide sensory sensation all the way down to your vocal cords. Um, yeah, and that's just sensory only. The rest of your vagus nerve goes all the way down and it loops. So under the left side, it loops under the aorta. On the right side, you don't have the aorta, so it loops under your subclavian artery. And then this loops back up. And because it's coming back up, it kind of slots under um, these muscles and then returns to your larynx to supply all your vocal um, cord muscles. Um, and, that's, and so that's the one you're worried about um, in terms of like a thyroidectomy. You can see your thyroid is there. So if you cut that and then this is supplying most of um, your vocal cord muscles, then um, you're going to yeah, have a hoarse voice. This is another picture. So hoarseness is not a disease, it's a symptom, it can be caused by lots of things, tobacco overuse, recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy is the one they love. Um, so for thyroidectomy, you can see um, there are a number of things at risk. The external superior laryngeal nerve, your recurrent laryngeal nerve, your parathyroid glands, which are on the, the inside of your thyroid. And you're also very worried about post-thyroidectomy hemorrhage. Um, that's because um, you've, it's quite tightly bound by this fascia. Um, and so if it's bleeding, then you're worried that it's going to put pressure um, on your airway and cause airway obstruction. And that's, and so like lots of um, patients after they have thyroid surgery actually have a special type of suture which you can easily undo um, in case that happens. This is the last slide, I think. So this is common sites for foreign body lodgement. You have your periform fossa on either side of your laryngeal inlet, rima glottidis, so your vocal um, cord, your follicular. This isn't super important, this is quite low yield. And then your Killian's dehiscence. And that's it. All right, I'm going to pause record, stop recording now.